You are now unmuted. You are now muted. Right. I think I had to unmute myself. Right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I just I just realized that. So good evening to everyone. A warm welcome. My name is uh, Dr. Nolson. I'm an alumni of the uh, College of Veterinary and Animal Sciences, Manati, 1998 batch. Uh, currently working at the Sharjah Equine Hospital. Um, it's located in UAE. I've been practicing here for the past um, 15 years. And yeah, so far so good. Happy to do a webinar in front of you. And uh, yeah, so let's get cracking. Right, this is my first slide. Now, uh, 10 years ago, I had my first child, uh, a baby boy. And at uh, that time, um, as every new parents were, uh, me and my wife, we were very excited and also confused being the first child, you don't know what to do. So um, it was all, it all went well. And then uh, we came home. My boy initial days was behaving very well, pretty good child. By day three, things started changing. Boy became slightly bigger, slightly louder. So we were like, okay, what's uh, this? This is not normal. And then by a couple of days later, he's, he, the way he started crying became more and more louder. And we were like, wow, this is really bad. And one night he didn't stop crying. I was very, very concerned. And uh, I called a pediatrician and what she told us is, is your child having colic? And uh, I said, Wow. So it's surprising on two levels. Uh, the first thing being that uh, I never knew children colic or rather humans colic. Second of all, being a veterinarian and that to an equine practitioner, uh, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't figure it out. So I was quite surprised. So then I realized that actually we vets are a bit of a pediatrician because our patients also, uh, they, they don't talk. They give you only signs and uh, you have to figure out what your patient has. So that's why I find there's a strong connection between us and our pediatrician. Right, so let's get into our main topic for the day, colic. Right, so what is colic? Now, a colic is a broad veterinary term that is referring to any sort of abdominal pain in an equine or in any animal. Now, there are many factors that can cause colic. One of the primary factors that we are focusing today is the gastrointestinal tract. Now, besides that, you can have colic from uh, urinary problems, reproductive problems, and uh, other factors. Now, a study done in 2001 has found that out of 100 horses in a general population, four to, four to 10 cases of horses are bound to have a colic once a year. And among this, 10 to 15 of these cases can have repeated colics, around two to four episodes in a year. Comes to the question, why do horses colic? As you can see, there are a couple of factors. Now, the first factor I would like to point out is the anatomy of the horse itself. Horses cannot vomit. There's a reason to this. The esophagus of the horse, the, as it enters into the stomach, there's a strong sphincter there that acts like a one-way valve. Now, the problem with this thing is that when the stomach is full with contents, the contents, rather than coming out through the mouth or through the nostril, starts packing up there as a result of the sphincter. And in some cases, when the distension becomes extreme, the stomach can explode. Another factor why a horse cannot vomit is also the esophagus enters the horse stomach at an acute angle. So that also prevents the horse from uh, vomiting, which is the problem with the anatomy of the horse. The next factor which uh, I'd like to point out is um, actually people think the more you feed a horse pelleted diet high in energy, the more stronger or the more powerful it becomes, which is a thought process in this part of the world, which I see quite often, which is wrong. I mean, mind you, a horse in nature spends almost 80% of the day grazing, 80 to 90 rather. So they usually spend, you know, max around 19 hours grazing. Now, what happens is when they graze the forage, the chewing action 
stimulates the production of saliva. And this saliva, as it enters the stomach, it neutralizes the acid. Now, mind you, the saliva that spring produces alkaline in nature, hence it neutralizes the acid and helps in preventing in the buildup of acidity in the stomach and also finally gastritis or gastric ulcers. Also, another factor for that could cause the alcoholic from a high quality diet is that, as you all know, horses, unlike cows, are high gut fermenters, meaning the fermentation of the food takes part in the cecum of the horse. Now, what happens is when the roughage enters the cecum, it goes fermentation, it undergoes fermentation and produces volatile fatty acids, which produces and which provides energy. So instead of this roughage, if grains start passing into the stomach, into the cecum, what happens is the grains are very acidic and they change the pH of the cecum. Now what happens as the pH of the cecum changes, there are good bacteria that are in the cecum that start dying and there are bad bacteria, rather bacteria that are not favorable that start perforating. Now that's not good for the cecum, neither for the horse. And this causes the toxins to be released into the blood and that can cause endotoxemia and other complications such as laminitis. So typically, if you want to feed a horse, what you have to do is feed 0.5 percentage of the horse's body weight as a concentrate. And we we'll repeat, 0.5 percentage of the horse's body weight as concentrate. That's for example, like a 1,200 pound horse, you can feed them six pounds of concentrate. And if you want to feed rough age, basically feed them one to 1.5 percent of their body weight of rough age. Right? This is a golden rule, please do keep it in mind while feeding horses that it's not the pellets that's most important, rather the forage. Right? Okay. Let's bring to the next point, the quality and the type of the forage that we feed this. Now, as the forage or the grass matures, the content of the indigestible fiber increases because you know, it, it, it matures and it becomes more fibrous. So what happens when you feed the horses these kind of hay, which are basically low in quality, it increases the risk of colic. So that's why the quality of the hay is very, very important. Right? Then the rapid change of diet. Now, as I mentioned before, the cecum of the horse has, it's like a fermentation vat where there are a lot of microbes that are doing the fermentation producing energy. Now, when you change the diet, either the forage or the grain very fast or rather quickly, the horse's microbe cannot adapt to it very easily. And what happens is, as you, as I said before, if you feed them a high pellet diet or a diet that they are not used to, the cecum and the associated microbes find it hard and they, they die or they cause a lot of production of gas, which results in colic, right? So how you would feed is basically, you have to, if you're feeding a concentrate, it's recommended to replace 25% of the current concentrate with the new concentrate every other day till there's been a full transition. Meaning by progressively, you have to add the new diet. Don't all of a sudden, okay, Let's 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 just give him a new foot. No, no, that doesn't work. You got to be very patient. Twenty-five percent one day, slowly add. And mind you, add the old diet also, not just the new diet. Twenty-five percent new diet, seventy-five percent old diet. Slowly next day again, increase in twenty-five percent and progress to do that. Similarly with the forage, that's the hay. You can do it twenty-five percent increments over one to two periods of one to two weeks of time. So that means that to take it, take, take it slowly, you know, don't, don't, don't think feeding a horse too much of good stuff is good. You know, you can, you could be in trouble. Right. Uh, obviously, uh, the next point is uh, deworming. Um, and that, that, that's, that's no rocket science. I mean, uh, if you have uh, worms in your abdomen or in your colon, in your GI tract, you're bound to have trouble. So improper deworming schedule, very, very, very important. Uh, luckily, in our part of the world, where I'm from Sharjah, UAE. We do have home issues, but I wouldn't compare it to anything what they would be having in countries where they have a lot of lakes and green pastures because that's the favorable environment for the worms to survive. So we do have a fair share of problems, but not to that extreme. Right. So the next problem, the next reason is why horses colic is poor dental practice. Now, um, a horse, as you may know or may not, uh, the, the, the teeth is inside the skull of a horse. I mean, as the horse get, ages, the teeth slowly push their way all the way into the mouth and that's how the horse has a wear and tear of its teeth. Now, if a horse teeth is 
not having proper contact because of malocclusion uh, or because of poor diet rather than, you know you're not giving constant amount of uh, hay there is no proper attrition among the occlusal, occlusal surface of the teeth this leads to sharp enamel points uh, fractures and other complications so what needs to be done is every 9 to 10 months or rather 12 months you need to check the horse's teeth and if necessary which i'm sure it would be you need to do dental rasping and if you see any fractured tooth, you need to do the necessary procedures. So dental practice is one of the reasons. Now, how would you figure that out? One way is to put your hand in the horse's mouth. Not recommended. You could have, you could have it bitten off. But other way of seeing that is the feces. Now, when you check the feces of a horse, which is the product of the end product of digestion, if you see there are hay fibers that are longer than one centimeter. There's a high prob probability that your horse needs a dentist urgently. Also, there are other factors like quidding, meaning that the horse starts forming balls of hay as they chew and they drop it onto the floor. So that's another way of saying, oh, I think my horse needs a dentist. And there are other, other, other factors that help to determine, but these are the classical ones. Uh, another factor being, uh, which, which I'm, we are very common, uh, faith, commonly facing here is sand. Uh, sand does cause a lot of colic here, unfortunately. The reason being, uh, they feed sometimes uh, the hay on the floor, and as a result, the horse ingests the hay along with the sand. Some horses, they have, uh, they're not being fed well, and they do consume a bit of sand, unfortunately. Uh, and some, for some, it's a wise. I mean, they learn it that, you know, let's have a bit of sand, let's some bit of salt. So they, they, they accumulate sand over years, which ultimately uh, causes an impaction or uh, some, some problem which leads to colic, right? And the last factor being climate. Climate, why? Because uh, when, uh, like in, when, when the weather changes, typically from summer to winter, we get to see that a horse, a lot of horses colic. And the reason being they drink less, hence they remain less hydrated. So when you have less hydration, obviously the food they have consumed tends to get impacted. Yeah, right. Now, uh, based on the time frame, when you tell a vet or when you want to explain uh, when, how long the horse will be colicking, based on the chronicity, there are three types. Acute, chronic, and recurrent. Acute is nothing but you know, within 24 to 36 hours, the horse has been colicking. That's an acute colic. More than 24 to 36 hours, chronic. And horses that have been repeatedly colicking uh, like for the past two to three days, that's not normal. They're called recurrent colics. Yeah? I hope I'm not speaking too fast. If anybody has a problem, please do uh, mention in your comments, yeah? Okay. Speed is okay. Okay, thank you, Dilip. All right. Colic symptoms. Before I proceed, I would like to tell you that I'm going to use an application. Uh, it's called the Glass Horse. Rather, it's a CD, it's a program, and um, it's made by a company called uh, Science in 3D. They are based in uh, Georgia, USA, and they have this beautiful CD that makes the horse basically transparent, and you can understand colleagues. Uh, they have CD for colleagues, they have for um, uh, distal hoof, distal limb, uh, they have for the, for, 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 I think that's something they call the glass dog. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the CD bits and bits and pieces wherever I feel is appropriate so that you can see like a like a like a video what I'm trying to explain yeah so it's called the glass horse if interested do go online purchase it it's very useful very useful and very interesting yeah so um colic symptoms so let me see if I can play uh, the glass horse okay yeah. mm -hmm. So the typical signs of colic, we are going to show it here.
Now, keep in mind, uh, not all horses show the same kind of colic symptoms. Why I say this is because uh, certain breeds, like the cold-blooded ones, they are a bit more stoic. Um, they don't show colic signs easily as uh, the Arabian horses that we have more often here. These guys, they, are, they, they keep quiet. The only sign you might observe is that you know, he's not eating his, his hay or he's not eating his pelleted greens as usual. He's mildly depressed. Be careful. He's most probably had colic in since a while, but he's so strong that these guys don't show it. And by the time he shows these clinical signs that I've shown you now, it's surgical. And sometimes it's a bit too late. So always keep in mind, not all horses show the same clinical signs or rather colic signs. Yeah. Right, so are the other signs which you could also come across is biting at the sides, stretching out, kicking at the belly, excessive rolling, pawing, which is one of the classic signs, lip curl, same like the Fleming reaction, not eating, which is like, you know, he doesn't want to touch the, 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 the owner or the groom, usually says, ah, he's not been eating like normal today, there's something wrong, excessive lying down. Yeah, which is something that's the classic sign. Your horse lying down, there's something that's happening. I mean, if he's having a happy roll, like he just goes on the floor, has a roll in the mud, that's perfectly fine. But if he's lying there more often or lying there for longer time than usual, keep an eye, there is a problem. Uh, in this part of the world, we, when, when we are on night duty, the classical phone call, we get, doctor, doctor, uh, my horse is not urinating. We say, colic. No, 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 it's not colic. He's not urinating, he has urinary problem. My friend, he's got colic. You tell, okay, you know what? Bring the horse over to the hospital and we'll check. Guess what? It's a colic. So uh, not urinating, not defecating, defecating small amounts. There's also other clinical signs that you need to look into to see if a horse is normal or not, or rather colic. Right. Okay, now to um, explain uh, the colic, first we need to know the equine gastrointestinal tract anatomy. So as you can see, the digestion obviously starts with the mouth, the teeth, they chew, food goes to the esophagus, into the stomach from various parts and small intestine, through the duodenum, jejunum, and the ileum. Sorry, I've got a message. Can ex sorry, I've got, got a question from Mr. Amrit Panu. Can excessive lying down also symptom of acidosis in horses? Uh, well, in horses, Basically, that are colicking. I, I'm sure you're referring to metabolic acidosis. Yes, you see that uh, they 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 have, they have acidosis. When you do a blood test, basically the pH is most of the times uh, acidotic rather than alkaline. You do get an alkaline, but it's more of a acidotic that you get to see, right? Uh, and uh, let me I'm going back to the anatomy. So the the small intestine, as you know, is uh, divided into duodenum, jejunum, ileum. Uh, then it goes into the fermentation part known as the cecum. From there to the large colon. From the large colon to small colon to the rectum. Yeah. Again, I'm going to use the glass horse because they have done a spectacular job of explaining the equine anatomy, which is very important for us to understand the colic uh, signs, symptoms, and uh, related stuff. Thank you. 
So let's, uh, let me do another video, which is actually more similarly informative, but that tells you how the digestive tract is. So. All right, here you go. Excellent, right? So that's how it, the digest tract looks like. Now, this is another view where you can play around with it by uh, sliding the cursor up and then you start, you see how the, the, the organs are located. So as I slide my, 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 yeah, as I slide my thing forward, you can see the stomach, the small intestine, the cecum, the ascending colon, the descending colon, the liver, spleen, and the pancreas. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. All right. So I'm assuming that all of you have figured out the digestive tract of a horse. A couple of questions. While uh, Raj has asked patches of sweating, I'm assuming you're asking about the colic. Uh, you do have uh, sweating. Yes, you do. Well, patches means you can see around the neck, basically, that the horse has been sweating. And this usually happens when the colic is quite severe. So voice echoing in video, you can mute that and explain in your own voice. <laughs> I wish, <laughs> but the thing is, she's done a better job. So I can understand that, but then the idea is just to, uh, just to uh, show you the anatomy. But there are only very few videos, so yeah. So let's get along. So uh, now, usually when they explain uh, equine colic, their classification is spasmodic colic, uh, obstruction type of colic. Uh, and uh, uh, gas type of colic. Now, my, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the colic as per the GI tract, starting from stomach, small intestines, large colon, small colon. Yeah, right. So let's start with the stomach. Now, the stomach of a horse basically has a capacity of eight to 15 liters. Uh, which is basically 8% of the gastrointestinal tract. Then one of the major problems that we face in the stomach is the equine gastric ulcer syndrome. In short, we call it IGUS, right? Now it's seen that in uh, adult horses, basically 60 to 90% of the adult horses have uh, gastric ulcers and in foals, 25 to 50% have gastric ulcers. You would be surprised. I've, I've actually been very surprised. Uh, some racehorses, they come in and they look absolutely fabulous, stunning, shining. And the owner says, he's not performing well. And then you're like, you know what, let's do a gast gastroscopy. Boy, oh boy, you'll be surprised. The stomach really looks disastrous, but the horse looks very well. So the horse, they're very good at hiding such kind of pain. But when it's, but certain breeds, they easily show, show that, certain don't. So uh, when you see a horse losing weight or not performing well, one of your first differential should be, is he having gastric ulcers? Now, as you know, uh, the equine stomach is divided in two parts, the non-glandular and the glandular. Now, the non-glandular is made of the squamous epithelium. Uh, ulcers, which we, is usually seen in the non-glandular rather more rather than in the glandular. In a horse, what are the causes? 
of these uh, gastric ulcers. Now, well, first reason being stress. Uh, the reason why stress is a re is a cause is simply because horse the horse is a very uh, sensitive animal, and when when you're sensitive, you get easily stressed, and when you're stressed, you perf you, you you produce the hormones called a hormone called cortisol, which humans also produce. So what happens when this cortisol they interact with the vagus nerve, which controls the digestion, that causes ulcers. Now, some factors that cause stress are shipping. Changing of diets, changing of schedules, uh, performance, these all cause a lot of stress. So uh, when, you, when you ship a horse for performance or for a race, yeah, get, you think they might be enjoying the whole trip, but, but, but be careful, they're easily fooling you. They are basically stressed. Yeah. Uh, another factor being, as I explained before, a high grain, low forage diet. The reason being, when you have a high carbohydrate diet, these, diet, these, these carbohydrates, they release volatile fatty acids which enter the stomach cells and uh, they cause ulcers. Yeah. Then uh, another reason is high workload, physical activity. So what happens is when they are into a race, the abdominal muscles, they start contracting. And when they contract, they basically cause the stomach also to contract. And as a result, the uh, acid that is produced by the stomach basically in the glandular region splashes onto the non glandular onto the non glandular region the squamous region and this irritates it and basically after a long while it can cause uh, gastric erosions gastritis and gastric ulcers the re research has found that exercise basically can increase gastric gastric acid production and uh, also decrease blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract which basically causes uh, gastric ulcers. Now another reason also being is uh, long periods of fasting. As I mentioned before a horse needs to graze at least 16 to 19 hours a day. The reason being the, the, the chewing itself causes uh, production of saliva which is alkaline in nature and this buffers the acid that's produced in the stomach preventing a drop in pH. So if you are not having enough saliva, the pH, increase, pH drops and that attacks the stomach mucosa and causes gastric ulcers. Uh, next one is the NSAIDs and uh, the reason why they cause uh, ulcers is simply because they block the COX-1 enzyme which uh, thereby disrupts the production of prostaglandins in the stomach which is basically uh, protecting, protecting the stomach from forming ulcers. So if your COX-1 is blocked, uh, you're, you're basically causing the, it affects two things. It affects the stomach and also the kidney. So be careful of using excess NSAIDs, that's non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. Yeah, so these are a couple of factors that are responsible for causing uh, gastric ulcers in horses. Now, what are the typical signs that you would expect? Uh, one of the classic signs is that the moment after they have their hay or the food, Immediately, the horse starts pawing, rolling, and the first thing you should come in your mind, most probably has gastritis or gastric ulcers. Also, they show a preference in their diet. They prefer to eat roughage than grain diet. Why? Because the grain diet causes a drop in pH, which produces more acid, attacks the mucosa, and causes gastric ulcers. Horses are smart, yeah? And also, uh, can, you can see weight loss, change in behavior. Yeah, they're, they're pissed off, you know, they want, don't want anything because basically they don't feel good inside. And it's no surprise, I mean, humans itself, when we are not feeling good inside, we are a bit pissed off. I mean, ask about me, I get really pissed off, especially when I'm hungry. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, so what are the, there are different levels of uh, gastric ulcers. Now, how do we diagnose it? By obviously doing a gastroscopy, which I should be discussing later. Uh, so um, there are different grades, now, as you can see in these pictures, uh, you have the upper squamous epithelium and the bottom glandular epithelium and the line that separates it is the margo plicatus. Now, there's, there are different grades. Grade zero, perfectly healthy stomach. Grade one, you see very like dot-like ulcers. Grade two, you see bigger, bigger ulcers. Grade three, extensive lesions are on the margo plicatus. Actually, there are four and rather at, the, at, at our hospital, we would classify it four plus five plus because there are certain stomachs that are so horrible that they are basically bleeding or sometimes even necrotic and close to a rupture, which has happened many times because of excessive use of NSAIDs. You know, the, the, the owner doesn't know how these drugs work and they just keep on giving the horses uh, these drugs just to suppress the pain. 
and eventually as the stomach becomes more and more worse, it gives up, it just ruptures. Yeah. So how do we treat these colics? Uh, we treat them using uh, omeprazole, uh, which is basically a proton pump inhibitor that decreases the amount of acid that's produced in the stomach. Uh, this usually you give it once a day at around, around 4 mg per kg. Uh, you can combine this. Uh, so the omeprazole, we usually give it for like grade one ulcers, grade one, grade two, you know, one to two, you, you can you can you can play around with omeprazole. While if you're having grade three, you need to step up the game. So then you can add ranitidine. Ranitidine is basically a H2 blocker, a histamine two blocker. Uh, so what they do is uh, they also decrease the production of acid. Usually we give ranitidine, or rather the recommended dosage is two to three times per day at 6.6 .6 mg per kg three times daily. I repeat, 6.6 .6 mg per kg three times daily. Also, we could we could combine sucralfate. Now, sucralfate it's um, it it binds to the unbound proteins and uh, like it binds to the areas where basically you have erosions in the stomach. That's gastric uh, ulcers, and uh, actually it helps in soothing those ulcers uh, before being before being attacked by the acid. Now, sucralfate we give it also basically two to three times per day at 20 mg per kg at 20 mg per kg so cryophate you can give it, actually we give it four times and that we usually use at the uh, very bad ulcers uh, i forgot to mention a, a point and now um arun kumar is asking ranitidine 6.6 .6 mg by oral route yes 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 6.6 .6 mg oral route uh, there is a drug called pantoprazole yeah. Now, when you have really bad ulcers, like grade four and above, you could use pantoprazole. Uh, so how you do it is basically, please repeat the dosage. Uh, yeah, I will do that. So pantoprazole, basically, uh, it's a 40 mg ampule. So what we do is, depending on the body weight of the horse, each ampule is for 75 kilo of the horse. So one ampule, which is 40 mg, is for 75 kilo of the horse. So you have to see how much is the body weight. Divide by 75, that's the amount of ampules you need to use. You dilute them in half a liter of 5% dextrose and you give it IV once a day. I repeat, it's one ampule is for 75 kilo of the horse. You decide how many ampules you need, dilute in 5% dextrose, half a liter, and give it IV. You can combine it with the rhinitidine, which gives you better results. And mind you, in four or five days' time, the hormones stomach is almost 80 to 90 percent healed. Amazing product, amazing product. I would highly recommend our vets to use that, pantoprazole, yeah? So Deepan had asked me about uh, the dosage. I think he's asking the dosage for omeprazole. Omeprazole is at 4 mg per kg once daily. Ranitidine is at 6.6 .6 mg per kg three times daily. Sucralfate is at 20 mg per kg four times daily. Duration of pantoprazole, uh, you can give it minimum three days and uh, or in five days. I mean, you can do that. And uh, trust me, this works like wonder. Can you share the notes related to the dosage? Yes, I can do that. Um, if, you can, if you can drop me your email, I will definitely do that. Sorry, I'm put here because I'm, in this part, I'm just dis discussing about the disease. Uh, but yeah, I will do that for you. Yeah, just drop me your email. Perfect. Please tell me the method to diagnose if there is no gastroscopy. Ah, if there is no gastroscopy, uh, who is this Chakravarti? Basically from clinical science, there's no other way. There is no other way you need to have a gastroscope. And uh, yeah, no, you can't. Pandaprosol frequency, uh, three to five times, wait, I mean once daily, yeah? once daily for three to five days. I would recommend five days. Just getting a few more questions. What is the um, Heliobacter pylori? What is the association with the H. Bacter pylori? Nothing much. We have there's no association much. I can't like humans. No, you don't. You don't. There have been studies and it hasn't proven anything. No. Right. Is there any pathogenic clinical science for gastric ulcers? Nothing much. I mean, you would see a horse having weight loss. As I said, the a healthy horse, the moment it starts eating, if you see him lying, lying down or rolling, number one differential gastric ulcers yeah 
Is there ranitin oral paste available? No, we don't use that. We use the tablets. Do all horses have uh, dic diction? Do all horses having gastric ulcers suffer from colic? No, no. Very good question. That's my whole point. They are very good at masking pain. They wouldn't show you. Uh, they wouldn't show you colic symptoms unless it's very bad. And also. Uh, certain horses are very stoic. They don't show you. As I said, I've been surprised. Certain horses they come in perfectly healthy, like they look perfect. But then the owner says that he's not performing as much as he's supposed to. And then you put the endogastroscope in. Voila! <laughs> Gastric ulcers. When to feed supply, like with feed, before feed, or after feed. I would feed it before the feed because you want to protect the stomach from the attack of the acid. So I would do that before the feeding. Right. So let's keep on watching. We have more, more slides to go. So it comes to the next part of our gastrointestinal tract, which is the small intestine. Now imagine the, imagine like a big garden hose pipe. That's how the small intestine is. It's uh, roughly around uh, 70 to 100 feet. And as you know, it's divided into uh, three parts, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Uh, the capacity of uh, the small intestine a horse is around uh, 68 liters and the percentage of the gastrointestinal tract it, it is is basically around uh, around 30 percent yeah so let's go to the next one anterior entritis it's also called duodenitis proximal jejunitis this is one of the big problems that we face uh, when you have a horse having uh, this issue basically it's the anterior part that is the duodenum and the proximal part of the jejunum that gets very inflamed uh, you we, we get to see it more often after a colic that's you know having a gastric very bad gastric impaction that has been staying there for a while it has caused irritation caused change of ph and hence the intestines small intestine being irritated they start they stop functioning they get inflamed and you have ileus so uh, th th that's what happens you get you get you get an entritis and uh, on the ultrasound what you get to see is distended small intestinal loops classic signs like a bunch of grapes uh, you, Usually you have like intestinal loops that are basically two centimeters less than that. But when you have an entritis, they start in getting enlarged three to four centimeters in five and the walls get thickened. Now, uh, uh, the, the, the clinical signs that you get to see uh, in these cases is that you get to see mild to severe colic. Uh, as I said, you get to see reflexing because what happens since there is no uh, proper movement of the small intestines, all the reflex comes back into the stomach, yeah? So uh, you don't have proper peristalsis, everything just comes back. And also you have to start having fever. Now the reason for, I mean, besides the, you know, as I said, the colic, uh, the reason the cause, the causative organism has still not been found, is they're speculating it could be clostridium perfusions. it's not been proved yet. And uh, yeah, the, the treatment basically is uh, you, have to decompress the stomach and uh, give medication. I'll be discussing this uh, further as we progress. Uh, sometimes what happens, you know, we vets, uh, we get to see the horse showing pain and distant small standard loops. There's nothing on rectal, three to four days, no improvement. So then you start wondering, is this horse having the proximal entritis or is any part of the intestine pressing onto the small intestine that's causing a mechanical blockage? At that point, we do uh, a surgery, but that usually takes three to four days or two to three days because we need to make sure basically if the horse is uh, having just an entrance, because in that case, you don't need to do surgery. But if it's a mechanical obstruction as a result of an impaction that's blocking it, then you're going to surgery. I can show you a video on this. Again, let's go back to the black horse. That's uh, a glass horse, sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry, I have a couple of questions. Whether Abhinav asked whether any incidence of intestinal pain after prolonged use of pandoprasol, do not use it prolonged. Do not. I would, I would recommend that. Just use it for four to five days and that's it. Uh, is it possible to see uh, remission loss? Is it possible to see the duodenum or the jejunum endoscopy? Yes. The du du duodenum, yes, you can enter if you're lucky. If you have a stomach that's completely empty, you might be lucky enough to see that. But then you need to have a completely empty stomach. Yes, ultrasound pictures are coming. Uh, Will supercalcium be effective when gastric pH is increased by ranitidine? It is, it is, it is, it is very effective. I would definitely say so. Is vanicillin carcinogenic? Yes, it is. In humans, I have heard that it is carcinogenic. So, yeah, see, bottom line, don't use excessive drugs. Only use if it's needed, and that's it. Can it be diagnosed by auscultation? Uh, I guess the question is based on 
this morning of this anti enteritis auscultation you can't you can't what can we find on exploratory surgery uh, of definitive diagnosis i guess for small intestine anterior enteritis uh, you see just distant small intestine loops completely angry this is popping out like a big hose of water that's full of fluid and air it is pop out when you open the intestine right so i'm going to play the video of how our anterior enteritis looks like uh, let me see where that is Sorry, that's not the video I'm going to play. Collector version. This video has no sound up. So basically, how is this our proximal enteritis would look like? I mean, how would come would have to the patho pathogenesis? Yeah, they, they come out. Perfect. So right. Is there a hose? Is there a role of sodium bicarbonate therapy? Uh, they use it in, uh, in, in race horses for gear for making the alkalotic. Yeah, they do do that, but we don't use it. Can you please narrate the video you're playing? There's an echo and the words are not clear. Uh, that's only a video. There are no words. I've muted the words. So you're just seeing a video as such. Yeah, that's just a video. There's no, there is no words in that. It's just to show how the proximal enteritis happens. Right. So that is about proximal enteritis. I should be discussing the treatment later as we go forward. Right. Next one is an ileal impaction. Uh, now, um, as I said, you have the, the, the duodenum, duodenum, ileum. The ileum is the muscular part of the small intestine. Usually, uh, you get to see it from because of heavy tapeworm or when you feed Bermuda hay. And now we don't have a lot of we don't have tapeworm issues here, but we uh, do feed horses once in a while. I mean, not a lot of stables, but they do feed Bermuda hay, and that's one of the causes of uh, the ileal impaction. What happens? It usually happens the ileum or the ileocecal junction, where it enters the cecum, is where it gets blocked. Uh, the only way you can definitely diagnose is by uh, surgery. Obviously, before surgery, you can do an ultrasound. You see distant, small distant loops, but then. What's the problem? You wouldn't be able to figure it out. And the horse would be colicking and you know things like the lactate and stuff would be increasing and then you go into surgery. And in surgery, what they do is they basically uh, massage the uh, impaction to the seeker. Okay, I'll play a video on that. Right. <laughs> I think I've done an error here. I don't have a medium impaction, unfortunately. I don't, I don't think I have it. But then it's just the ileum getting blocked. I mean, there's nothing much. And it's similarly to a, to a proximal enteritis where the whole, where the whole small intestine gets distended with contents. Right. Uh, then we have uh, the pedantilated lipoma. Now, uh, lipoma is nothing but a benign fatty tumor. It's like a fatty mass. Now, when you, uh, when you get a horse that's basically elderly and you see that the horse is coming with a very bad colic this should be one of your differentials that uh, there could be a case of a lipoma you couldn't diagnose it other ways uh, through rectal or through ultrasound i don't know if you can through ultrasound you might be really, should be really lucky to see it uh, but if, uh, this is one of your differentials especially if it's a middle aged to an older horse you get to see especially in geldings uh, uh, arabs and the quarter horse are very prone to it it usually is in small intestine that gets wrapped around the small colon and uh, the only way to diagnose is through surgery and when you open it if as you can see in the picture uh, even if it's, it's, since it strangles it uh, you might have to sometimes resect it depending on how uh, severe or how long the lesion how long the colic has been going on let me see if i can play a video on this one at least <laughs> uh, 
Wait until later, like, oh, yeah, I do have a video. Mm -hmm. oh, Test an Austrian election by a pedunculated with oil. These fatty tumors grow in stalks that originate from the mesentery and can wrap around the lupus intestines once again to become strangulated. The way this might occur is when a hormone peristaltic wave is a long small intestine, simultaneously frustrated the double intestine, and will be normal through a half age formed by the stalk. Right. Uh, so lipoma, yes, we need to do a laparotomy. Yeah, yeah, we need to. We need to. I still remember the only case or one of the few cases I've seen. The horse came in complete fashion and uh, we had to take immediate surgery and it was an elderly horse and uh, it was indeed uh, a lipoma. Uh, whether like, yeah, uh, Jilani, she's asking whether liquid paraffin is useful in colic. Definitely, yes. I'll be discussing that as we progress forward. Yeah. Cool. Uh, the next one is the epiploic foramen entrapment. Now, this is a dangerous dude. The problem, like the lipoma, is that you cannot diagnose it uh, otherwise unless you do, in, unless you go into surgery. Uh, so what happens is uh, there is this foramen uh, that is present. Uh, it, it basically separates the omental bursa from the peritoneal cavity. It's basically useless foramen, and small the stain, they, they 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 go through that. And so what happens is the small intestine, they, they pass through it from the left side of the abdomen and they go into the epiploic foramen to the right side. The ileum and jejunum is what is mainly involved. And now the horses that are basically prone to this are horses that do crib biting and wind sucking. You know, these, when you have a horse that's crib biting, wind sucking, and he's having colic, this is small intestinal loops. This should be high on differentials. A horse having previous colic, older horses, why? Because uh, it's uh, since it's besides the liver, this foramen, when the right lobe of the liver goes undergoes atrophy, you have more space. And the small intestine uh, moves through that. Uh, the diagnosis for this is through surgery. Uh, I basically had a case, and I, I still remember that it was uh, eight or 10 years ago, a uh, horse came with colic, uh, one or two smiley distended loops. He, wasn't, he was painful initially, but then uh, he started becoming quiet and the lactate, which we measure usually for a colic, was something like two point something. So I assume basically it's from dehydration. And we gave fluids, he was quiet. And after four hours of uh, treatment, he started colicking violently, went into surgery. Guess what? Epiploic. And it was not a good case. So I find really, we are really concerned. You know, the horse has distant small intestine loops, and you have no other reasons uh, or other signs. Be careful. It could be an epiploic for amyl entrapment. Now, uh, I'm not sure if you can see the picture to the right, which I have posted. Can you guys say what is the error in the picture? Anybody? It's a tricky question. Perfect. Abdul Qiyum gallbladder is absent. Exactly. This is this is the picture from a human anatomy. Actually, I stole it just because to explain horses don't have gallbladder. Well spotted. Good job. Right. So I'm going to. You are now unmuted. <laughs> you are now muted. <laughs> you are now unmuted. You are now muted.
Okay, am I audible? Hello. Okay. Sorry, I had a bit of a problem with the mic. I as what uh, Santosh told me. Yeah, perfect. Oh wow, I got a lot of this. <laughs> cool. I'll play that video once again. Um, my screen once more. Right. Uh, yeah, Mahindra, actually, uh, that, that video is all what I said about before. It's just telling what how it happens. So that that video is not quite audible. I totally agree with you. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's the way they explain. And I do agree. It's not a clear video. Yeah, clear audio rather. But the idea is to understand how it happens. OK, right. Let's go to the next slide. Intersubstruction. Basically, it's the telescoping. Tele the small dust time they telescope into each other, uh, you get to see in a uh, case of where the an an anoplocephala perforator, which we don't see here, we get to see in uh, younger horses. This is just, I thought I'll prefer it. I've never seen a case actually. And you get to see in less than three years of age that signs are acute to chronic colic, and uh, surgery is the only or surgery is the only option. I mean, I don't see when you do a, and basically, I would assume when you do an ultrasound, uh, you could see a, a bull's eye. That's what typical lesion is, a bullseye. We, we, we have uh, basically not seen other horses, but in young babies, I have uh, seen, or rather, I, wait, I'm lying. Actually, I've seen a pony. We have seen an intersubsection. And at that point, when we did an ultrasound, uh, it seemed like a bullseye. So that's the way to diagnose it. But then it was not from this endoplocephala. Uh, Manish is asking, can you please elaborate the person your occurrence of a clinical conditions? I mean, what chance if I'm possible? <laughs> Manish, I'm sorry, I don't have the percentages with me. I can look for you, but I don't have the percentages. It, I think it varies with country and with places. And I don't know if anyone has done a broad clinical study on that. I have no idea. Uh, where to scan with USG? Uh, Ramesh, what do you mean USG? Can you just elaborate that, Ramesh? Where to scan with USG? Ultrasound, oh, you mean ultrasound guided? I mean, gee, for what? For uh, for small intestine? Yeah, I mean, you scan basically the, the ventral part of the abdomen on the left and the right. And if you see this, the small intestine loops, be, that's it. Be careful. Whenever you have small, this small intestine loops, trouble, trouble, trouble. Yeah, you don't want to see them. When you have a colic, when you see this small intestine loops, it's like OMG, could be a surgical case. Yeah, right. Which takes us to the next part of the gastrointestinal tract, the fermentation what? The cecum, which in our case in the, is the appendix. Now, in a horse, um, a cecum is basically four foot long. Uh, it has a capacity of roughly 28 to 36 liters and is around 15 percentage of the gastrointestinal tract. Right. So, one of the main conditions or the only condition that I have seen in the horse here is that uh, of a cecal impaction. Now, this 
this colic is a very dangerous colic. Why? The reason being, the horse doesn't show very strong colic signs. It's intermittently colicky, and uh, it's not very easy to diagnose even on an ultrasound. So what you sometimes feel is that when you do a vector, uh, so on vector, you can only feel the ventral band of the cecum. So if you feel that there's a tension or rather a distension of the cecum, be careful. You could have a cecal impaction. Or rather sometimes if it's an extreme case, you start to see that uh, there is an impaction. Now, this impact can be of a primary cause, which is due to you know, poor quality of age, improper dentition, poor dentistry, reduced water intake. Alternatively, you can also have from a secondary case, like uh, a painful condition, like an orthopedic condition. Uh, why? Because when the horses are uh, having an orthopedic issue, basically you stable rest of them. Now, in a horse, if you stable rest them, they don't move, and hence, uh, there's not proper gastrointestinal style motility. And one of the main problems that you could face is uh, cecal impaction, especially in sport horses. So be very careful that uh, you, can, you should be avoiding this by uh, giving them a uh, more softer diet, not too much roughage, more some easily digestible diet. Another reason also the use of NSAIDs, excessive use of drugs like phenylbutazone, uh, phenidine, or even lack of it. Why? Because when there's increased pain, there's decreased gastrointestinal motility. So the use or lack of use of NSAIDs can cause um, a cecal impaction. Uh, atropine administration, which is one of the drugs we use when we have corneal ulcers. So be careful when you have a corneal ulcer and you treat with atropine, uh, you should be careful that uh, your horse is not impacted. Now, how would you know that? If there's decreased uh, fecal output, it's one of your signs that, oh, oh, be careful, you might be starting to have an impaction somewhere. Anesthesia, as I mentioned, stall rest. These are, these are uh, a couple of reasons why you can uh, have a sickle impaction. Uh, now, the scene signs, as I previously mentioned, it's mild pain, intermittent pain, which can go for days to weeks. I personally had my own case. I had a horse that came in for colic. Uh, we thought it's a stomach impaction. Horse did very well. Two days later, it was seen mildly colicky. Well, we, we assumed it's gastric ulcers. We did a gastroscopy. Indeed, it was gastric ulcers. But even after treatment, he kept on intermittently colicky. One fine night, he had a very bad colic. And we went into surgery, and it was indeed a sequel impaction. By the time, it was a bit too late because it had already started necrotizing. So we couldn't do anything much for the horse. That's why I said this is a dangerous thing to have a sequel impaction. Uh, you got to be really careful. You know, when you feel there's a tense band of cecum, be very careful. I'll play a video.
Okay, uh, am I audible now? I think there's, there's, I think there's intermittent. Okay, there's yes, yes. Okay, perfect. You are now unmuted. You are now muted. Uh, am I audible now? You are now unmuted. You are now muted. Okay, perfect, good. Right, so uh, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, the diagnosis by rectal palpation, you see increased tension on the ventral band. Be very careful. Most probably you have a sequel impaction. Uh, usually we treat with uh, fluid therapy, oral laxatives, oral rehydration, using magnesium sulfate paraffin oil to uh, also basically they, they attract all the fluid to the cecum and they help in the softening the impaction. You can use flunix in meglumin, but use it wisely. Don't overuse it because uh, if it's a surgical case, uh, you know, you might be masking the pain and that can have disastrous effects. Uh, if it's surgery and if it's, a, if it's a really bad impaction, we will initially do a diflotomy and if you find that it's not, that the cecum is quite compromised, uh, you could do a seco colic uh, anastomosis. Right, there's a question from Amar Preet Panu. Which anesthetic combo is best for field surgeries taking half an hour time besides gas? So what we use is a triple drip. Yeah, so it's basically a combination of guaifenesine. Yeah, and you add to that xylazine, uh, roughly uh, like a 10% xylazine, you could add 10 ml of it, and you can add ketamine. 5 ml ketamine, so a bottle of geofenacine, 10 ml xylazine, no, 10 ml ketamine, 5 ml xylazine. I repeat, 10 ml ketamine, 5 ml xylazine, geofenacine. This type of anesthesia is good for 45 minutes. Yeah, okay. Can we use mineral oil? Yeah, yeah, you can use, you can use mineral oil. You can. Okay. Right. Go to the next big part of the small intestine known as the large colon. All right. So after cecum is a large colon, which is basically compromised of the uh, right ventral, left ventral, uh, and the dorsal columns. Uh, the colon basically, large colon is basically around 10 to 12 feet in length, uh, and it's around um, approximately like 86 liters, it's, it's the volume, and it contributes to around 38% of the gastrointestinal tract, right? Right. These are one of this, uh, this is one of the normal colleagues that we get to see a left dorsal displacement or rather a, a nephrosplenic entrapment. So what, what happens is your large intestine. So uh, as I mentioned before, or you, the, 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 from the right ventral colon, after the, the colon does turn at the sternal flexure, it comes and it, it, it turns to go from the right vent, left ventral goes to the left dorsal. At that point, you have something called the pelvic flexure, which is an important part of the small of the large colon. Because uh, why? Because most of the impactions happen there, and uh, and uh, the diameter is small. Hence, hence, hence the impactions. Now, what happens is uh, in the left dorsal displacement, the large intestine on the left side it migrates upwards. Now, if you see the picture, you see the lump, the black coloration. That's the spleen, and above it, you have the left kidney. Now, if you see this, there's, there's, there's a thin band that's connecting them. That's called the nephrosplenic ligament or the renosplenic ligament. Yeah. Now, what happens is the, the two rounds that you see at the bottom, the, that's the large colon. So it migrates all the way up and sits in that ligament. Now, in certain cases, the entrap is it's not complete, and then we say it's a left dorsal displacement. While when it's completely entrapped. In within the ligament, we call it like a nephrosplenic entrapment. Now, usually we see the larger horses are at risk, but you can also get to see in small Arabians also. The cost is unknown. Now, um, how do we treat it? Basically, we give these horses a drip of phenylephrine, 
So what it does is it contracts the spleen and makes the sleeve spleen smaller and it helps it in helps the colon from to slip back into position. So after you do the phenylephrine, you do a gentle exercise. But be careful with horses about 15 years of age. Uh, if you give uh, the, the, the phenylephrine, it can cause uh, hemorrhage. So just keep that in mind. Uh, other things is that you can do a rolling of the horse clockwise. And if not, sur if not successful surgery, I'm going to I'll be, discuss I'll be discussing the nephrospinic entrapment, the, 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 the treatment further as we discuss the treatment part of it. Yeah. So I have a question. Let me say there's no mechanics. My question is, how good is our treatment? Right, so, yeah, so Navneet is asking if, if uh, how aggressive should our treatment be uh, to prevent a gastric rupture? Uh, Navneet, that depends. First of all, your basic treatment when you treat a colic is gastric decompression. Yeah, you got to empty the stomach. And uh, if possible, leave the nasogastric tube in position or do the tubing repeatedly to prevent a gastric rupture. But then your question is how aggressive should be your treatment to be, to be safe? That depends on your lesion. Uh, that depends on your lesion. If you have this kind of small intestinal loops, do not give oral rehydration, bottom line, because from your stomach, it's not going anywhere. It's stuck in your stomach itself. So if you're having distant and small intestinal loops, do not give any sort of oral rehydration. On the contrary, try to decompress, decompress the stomach as often as possible. Because if your stomach gets ballooned up, obviously you will have a rupture. Yeah. By surgery, what is success rate? Uh, wow. Uh, you know, let me be really frank. I'm not a surgeon, so I don't know what a success rate of surgery. But let me tell you, of all the nephrospinic entrapment cases we have dealt with, most of them are successful after after phenylephrine and lunging. Most of them. So I, I rarely come across. We have very rarely done a surgery for a nephrospinic entrapment. The only time it would be needed surgery is when the colon becomes too heavy that it can't fall back in position. That's the only time. Not epinephrine, phenylephrine is what you need to use. There's a question based on that. Uh, can colic be caused by clostridial diarrhea? Yes, you can have colitis, and that itself can cause colic. Colitis X, also we call it. And you can't do anything much about that other than give fluids and uh, anti inflammatories. Those are phenylephrine. Good question. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll be discussing the treatments of uh, nephrospinic entrapment uh, as we proceed on the, on the, on the treatment side. Yeah? Good. Let me see if I have a video. Nice to have videos. Uh, yeah, I do. That's how a nephrospinic or left dorsal displacement looks like. Oh, my voice is not clear again. Oh, Mahindra, I mean, it's not me speaking, it's the thing, but then it's the whole principle, how it moves and what it happens. That's, that's my only idea of showing. But I'm sure you can hear me, yeah? Yeah, perfect. So let's go into the next slide. The left, then you have the right dorsal displacement. Yeah, in this case, the colon migrates between the cecum and the uh, right body wall. It's also seen in larger breed of horses. Uh, one of the major reasons for having a right dorsal displacement is, uh, as we discussed, uh, or rather we haven't discussed, uh, it's a pelvic flexure impaction. So as you're getting impacted, uh, the gas forms and you know the whole, imagine like a balloon. 
So you have a blockage, and behind the blockage, everything starts ballooning up, and uh, the colon starts migrating from the left to the right and starts forming uh, right dorsal displacement. Uh, some of them, they respond to medical management, but the majority needs surgery. Now, uh, in our situation here, when we uh, feel if it's right dorsal displacement, we do ask an owner, we do ask the owner, do you have permission for surgery? If he says no, we do start treating them with fluids, uh, oral rehydration, not to a large extent, but minimal, and exercise. And after two to three days, sometimes the, the colon falls back into position. The horse is lucky. You know, mind you, a colic, uh, which I, this is my opinion, I don't know how, how many people share with me, it's something that horses are born with. I mean, they, they, they do get colic, and nature has its own way. So, uh, you know, we do jump into surgery to save the life of the horse, but nature has its own way of solving it. Most probably, when a horse rolls, it's a way of correcting the colic. It's a way I see it. I don't know how many people agree because, um, uh, you know, there must have been so many surgeons, surgeons back, back in the ages. So the horse basically knows how to correct itself. And in, so most of the time, in right dorsal displacements, they just fall back into position. So, yeah, let's play a video to see how it looks like. Okay. Uh, does Chakravarti ask, does trauma or jumping is also a reason for entrapment and displacement? Could be. Yeah, because everything is floating inside, like freely. So, but I've never seen that as a real cause of entrapment or displacement. I've never seen that. It can, it can happen or cannot happen. Yeah. Right. Right, so another, the, the most, the, 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 the villain of this whole thing, of colleagues, the worst one, uh, is the volvulus, tors volvulus or torsion of the large intestine. Now, why I call this the worst one is because if unoperated in 30 minutes, your large intestine, start, your large colon starts getting devitalized, depending on the degree of torsion, like 180, 360, you know, above. So it's the worst form of colic. And uh, the horses that usually come with a colon torsion, uh, they re generally ref they don't respond to any sort of painkillers. I mean, it's later on, uh, you can't even diagnose it properly because they won't allow your electoral, they won't do ultrasound, and uh, the horse is basically dying. Uh, and the surgery is the need of the moment. So it's, 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 it goes very rapidly fast. I mean, the horse might be grazing and all of a sudden starts rolling, bloating, and uh, yeah, and the owner says, my horse is cannot stand him is very bad and one of your high differences should be a, a volvulus or a torsion. The reason being why it's bad is because as they rotate, uh, the missing trick blood vessels, the supply gets cut and there's no more blood supply and ischemia gets happens and necrosis and uh, devitalization. Uh, usually you get to see these in brood mares uh, after foaling, number one of your differentials. Uh, you get a call, my mare has just delivered two days ago and now she's colicking. Number one should be torsion of the large intestine. Uh, as a decolic change in diet, poor dental care, other other reasons. Now, uh, as I mentioned, the severity of or how bad this colic is uh, depends on how much the colon has rotated and how, and as a result, how long the blood supply has been cut off. Yeah. What are the criteria following for shifting from, me from medical therapy to surgery? Uh, I shall be coming to that. Yeah, I shall be coming. Stab enough. Yeah. I'll play your video on colon torsion. Mm -hmm. 
There is no, there is no audio for this. You are now unmuted. You are now muted. Hello. Hi. मॉडबल uh, किया कैसे या Okay, uh, am I audible now? Good, good. Okay, good. So, uh, what am I? Uh, is it good now? Okay, I hope it stays like this. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, it's basically uh, caused by ingesting a fly that's infected by Ehrlichia or Neurochitia restasi. I've never seen this case. Uh, the treatment is giving IV fluids, OTC, and endotoxic treatments. Prevention is by vaccinating, turning off the lights. I assume for keeping the flies away, clean water buckets. Next one is right dorsal colitis. Yeah. Now, when you have a colitis, basically of the right dorsal colon, it's uh, usually uh, when you give too much of NSAIDs long term, like for orthopedic issues, like when you use equipalison, phenidine, banamine, what happens is the right dorsal colon uh -huh. is the one that's usually affected and it gets very edematous. Uh, on ultrasound, you uh, get the colon wall thickness more than 0.4 centimeters. Now, if you, if you in order to treat it, what you do is basically put the horse on IV fluids and supportive therapy. There's nothing much you can do and keep your fingers crossed. Uh, the prevention is obviously stop using it or rather, you know, uh, avoid the long-term usage of NSAIDs such as Epalazone and shift to uh, selective COX-2, uh, COX-2 selective NSAIDs such as Firococcin or it's our trade name is also known as Equiox. Yeah, it's quite safe, right.
Uh, one of the major, major other problems that we face in this part of the world is uh, sand impactions. As you know, you know, we have a lot of sand around, and when they feed them on the floor, the horse consumes the sand along with the hay. Uh, the, the, the usual sites that are primarily impacted are the pelvic flexure and the right dorsal colon, because at this point, the diameter of the colon starts changing. Hence, you have these as a common sites. How do you diagnose? Uh, basically, when you do a rectal, you get feces that are covered in sand. And uh, what you could do is uh, you take these couple of balls of uh, the feces, like five to six balls, put it in a rectal glove, pour in water, rub it to, 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 to make it into a liquid and leave it hanging for 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. If there is sand, you see at the fingertips, where the fingertips of your glove, you would see there's sand accumulation. And basically, uh, that's what you're diagnosing. You have a sand colic. Uh, other way of diagnosing is radiography. But for this, you need very powerful machines. We at our facility don't have it, but then there are universities that have it, but you know we don't have it. But then when you see sand in the colon, in the feces, you're pretty sure that it's a sand colic. Uh, usually we treat them by uh, mild cases. Mild cases you can treat by using psyllium if you're lucky, uh, while otherwise you need to do surgical intervention uh, to evacuate them. Because by the time you evacuate them or by the time they go on the table, you give enough sand to build a building. It's no exaggeration. Sometimes it just keeps on coming and coming and coming. And you'll be wondering, my God, has this horse been on a sand diet? And that's the amount of sand that you can sometimes retrieve. Yeah. So there is a video that I would like to play again. in length. It's basically 16 liters in capacity and accounts to around 9% of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, the, one of the major colleagues that we see is uh, small colon impaction. Uh, we get to see in uh, horses that have had a very long diarrheal episode. Why? Because due to the diarrhea, the mucosal wall gets very inflamed and hence it uh, becomes edematous and causes the blockage of, uh, of, of, of the feces and causes an impaction. What you get to see is that uh, sometimes also you get diarrhea, you get fever, and you also get a low WBC count because all the WBC is rushing onto that inflamed site. Uh, diagnosis is very easy, rectal examination. Uh, usually we can treat this by using painkillers such as flunexin, giving broad spectrum antibiotics, and a mineral oil by nasogastric tubing. But sometimes, very rarely, uh, when the impaction is so hard that you can't treat it medically, uh, you need to do uh, enterotomy to evacuate that. Yeah? I don't have a video for that. Then, uh, obviously, you can have colic that's uh, of parasitic origin. Uh, and the clinical science, as you, as you know, in every animal is weight loss and colic. Uh, now, there are some prediction sites for prediction sites for these parasites, like for tapeworms, you get to see in the ileocecal junction. Uh, Cyathostomins, you get to see in the large uh, intestine, especially in the intestinal lining. Uh, the strong eyes, there you see in the blood vessels of arteries of the intestine. Uh, ascarids, you get to see in the intestinal lumen of force. That's basically uh, seen in younger animals, ascarids. How do you diagnose? Uh, well, one, you might see horses pooping out worms. Second, when you get the feces out, you could do a fecal egg worm count. 
Uh, and for tapeworm, we can do a tapeworm antibody test, which we don't do hand, because we don't have much of tapeworm issue, issues here. Uh, for cyathostomins, there's no way to diagnose it. We don't have much of ways to do that. Um, and as usual, I mean, deworming and rotating the deworming is the way to treat it. Pasture management and uh, monitoring uh, the fecal egg worm count by doing right routine testing is a way of diagnosing it. So the diagnosis, right. Now, before we go into the diagnosis, I would like to ask if you guys need a break. Uh, if yes, please mention, we can take a five minute break. If not, I could I'll proceed. Proceed. Okay, I get many proceeds, I guess. That's there. Proceed. Okay, let's go ahead. Right. As this picture says, <laughs> I found it's quite interesting. If only, if, if only we could, uh, we could, we could diagnose a gastric torsion or any sort of colic just from looking through the outside of horse. Uh, our jobs would have been so easy. But uh, a veterinarian's life is never easy. Yeah. So, so we have to do diagnosis using many techniques. Now, uh, the first, uh, the diagnosis you have to first. You know, the first thing you have to understand, does your horse have colic? Gajendra has, Gajendra asked me, please answer, what is the question? Role of gastro suspicion in colic? You have to put it the next step. If it's a colic, can you treat it medically or does it need an immediate surgical intervention? Right? And if it's going to be treated medically, what is your diagnosis of what kind of colic it is? I mean, you know, if it's a surgical colic, Trust me, you, you, diagnosing it's, you, you, it's going to be quite a difficult thing because the horse is not going to be cooperative. It might not stand, it will be completely recumbent and be thrashing around. So the first thing you'll be telling you, let's go into surgery if you have an option. Yeah? So let's start with the diagnosis of how you diagnose a colic. Basically, you ask the owner, the history, and analysis, common. You ask how, what, what sign did he see? Did he see the horse rolling? Did he see him uh, having a poor appetite, not eating his feed? Uh, what signs did he show? And also you will ask, has the owner given any medication? Be very careful because what, ha what happens here is that, or I don't show you any other part of the world, they give medication before sending the horse in. Without lab test, how do you say diagnosis? I need to say there's no lab test. I'm yet to come to that point, Mahindra. So be a bit patient. So uh, diagnosis, the history, yeah, and uh, behavior. Now, behavior of a horse is very, very, very. That depends on uh, what the owner tells you. Then it's the vital signs. Uh, you have rectal palpation, ultrasonography, blood work. That's the lab work I'm referring to, my hands on. The blood work, which is basically lab work. Not, not really lab work, I would say, per se, but then we use machine, known as the ISTAT, which is an immediate blood work we do. And we also do abdominal synthesis, right? So, uh, as I discussed before, the behavior, what are the clinical signs, like uh, bowing, rolling, flemming reaction, all those kinds of tests, all those kinds of uh, clinical signs you need to see if the horse is colic. Now, based on the vital signs, this is what uh, you need to uh, use to differentiate. So if uh, what's the, basically what you check is the heart rate. Yeah, first initially you check is the heart rate. Now if it's between 40 to 60, you have mild colic. 60 to 80, moderate. 80 above, severe, I would recommend. You need to consider surgery at that point. Uh, respiratory rate, you know, you are, you are, you are, you are not uh, very much concerned about the respiratory rate at that point. Because you are, you, you could use it as, as in a diagnosis, but I would rather go into the heart rate first. Temperature, most of the times, a normal horse has 37 to 38, even the mild to moderate colics. But in a severe case, you might have either a very low temperature because it's in a state of endotoxic shock, or rather, if it's having a diarrhea, which has caused a colic, you can have a temperature about 38 degrees. Yeah, like a Australian colitis. Uh, and the next thing you check is the mucous membrane. Pale pink, pale pink in mild to moderate colics is what you would see. By if it's a severe colic, bluish because of all the endotoxemia. Uh, CRT, which is the capillary refill time, one to two seconds is for a mild colic. 
two to four seconds in a moderate colic, about four seconds in a severe colic, uh, most probably uh, from the dehydration that he has been experiencing as a result of the colic. Gut sounds, obviously, as the colic gets worse, the gut sounds decreases, and obviously the feces also, when you have a mild colic, you might have normal feces, while if you have a moderate, small, small, hard fecal balls, and when you have a severe colic, you, move, you don't have a fecal, fecal, a fecal output at all, rather you might also have diarrhea. Passing gas, which is sometimes we ask the owner, do they, do they see, is it the horse passing gas? Uh, in the normal colic where there's no, like, like mild colic, when there's no major obstruction, you start seeing the horse passing gas, which is a very good sign, but doesn't mean that the colic is solved, yeah? Uh, and uh, for moderate to severe colics, you don't uh, see uh, any gas expulsion. Uh, and the pain level, you know, for a moderate mild colic, you see they're sweaty, looking at the belly, mild stretching, you know, those are mild signs. Either the horses have a very mild colic or the, it's the initial part of the colic. While as the colic gets worse or if it's a very bad colic, like uh, starting with a displacement, ending up in a torsion, uh, the scenes get uncontrollable. Like, for example, a horse that's been mildly colic, he's just rolling, can then be uh, uh, unretractable. You can't, can't, you can't get the horse uh, under control. What deworming schedule do you practice? Dick Shift is asking me. Um, well, uh, we use ivermectin plus prosecardio combination. As I mentioned, uh, we don't have a hot, huge worm load here, so it's not a it's not a very really important thing. We do deworming every three to six months here. Uh, how abdominus helps help in diagnosis? I'm coming to that. Less than two seconds is is normal for CRT. Yes, you it depends on how you how you see it. Less than two seconds is yes. And usually you get two seconds. Right. So uh, that comes to the most important part of our diagnosis of a colic, the rectal examination, the most important part. Be extremely, extremely cautious. Be very careful. Why? Because one, uh, the, the horse it might not be used to rectals, it can kick you, right? So be very careful. Second of all, the host rectal mucosa is very thin and very fragile. You could easily tear it. And as a veterinarian, and especially in equine Hello. Am I audible now? Right. Okay. So I said. Am I audible?
Uh, am I audible now? Yes, audible.
You are now muted. Hello. Hello. Yeah, you can hear me. Hello. You are now unmuted. Hello. Ah, Santosh. You are now muted. Okay. Santosh. You are now unmuted. No idea why this is happening. Yeah, you want me to continue? Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, so so the rectal examination. Yeah, that's where we stopped. So let me see. I hope it keeps on going well. All right. So the rectal examination. So uh, before we understand what. Uh, uh, the abdominal structures are, you should know what the normal structures are. So when you do a rectal, uh, on the left side, you have the spleen, uh, the uh, nephrosplenic ligament, you have the left kidney, the pelvic flexion. Uh, on the right side, you have the cecum, and um, uh, which, is, which basically can feel you see when you put the ventral band of cecum. On the dorsal side, you have the iota. On the ventral aspect, you have the large colon and the small colon. Uh, in mares, you can feel the uterus, and in stallions, you've got to check for the inguinal rings. Now, please keep in mind, whenever you get a mare or a stallion, you've got to check the reproductive tract, especially, especially, especially when you are uh, when you are checking a stallion and it comes for colic. Please do check the inguinal rings. Uh, can, can you guys hear me? Okay, okay. So, so um, the thing is, when you get uh, a horse that's been colicking, especially a stallion, sorry, I'm, I'm just, losing, just losing the flow. Okay, when you're getting a stallion, especially, first thing, check the testicles. If you have a swollen testicle, bingo, you have a problem. You most most probably having a hernia, an inguinal hernia. And how do you diagnose it? You do a rectal, when you find the when you feel the inguinal rings, there's definitely a small intestine that's going through it. Now, in mares, why do I recommend ovaries and uterus? Because uh, if you're having a mare that is colicking intermittently and is seven months pregnant, the first thing you should check is the uterus because there's a very high uh, possibility of a uterine torsion. And these mares are usually seven months pregnant or above, intermittently colicking, and you have nothing on the ultrasound. Your number one diagnosis should be, is this a uterine torsion? Always keep in mind, in mare, seven months pregnant, uterine torsion, stallions, swollen testicles, definitely there's going to be a cell on there, right? So that's, these are the uh, normal structures when you do a rectal examination. Now, what are the abnormal things that you might feel? Now, 
In the case of small intestine, uh, if there's a duodenitis or proximal jejunitis, you know, when this happens, you might have distant and small intestine loops. Not necessarily you might always feel it, but in case you feel it, keep that in mind. There's definitely uh, an enteritis going on. Also, it can be due to a lipoma, a strangulating lipoma. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned before, in a stallion, if it's a hernia, especially an inguinal hernia, you got to check the inguinal rings. Now, well, in the large colon, as you have seen all the different uh, colleagues, you, what you can expect is a pelvic flexure impaction. And as, you, as I said, when you feel in the left side, you can feel the pelvic flexure is quite hard and thick. That's basically a pelvic flexure impaction. Uh, a left dorsal displacement. How would you diagnose that? You put your hand in, you feel spleen, the left uh, spleen and the left kidney. If you have the nephrosplenic ligament that is tensed, or rather you have some colon sitting there, you definitely have a, a left dorsal displacement or nephrosplenic entrapment. Uh, on the uh, then uh, when, you, when you feel the cecum, if you have a tense ventral band of the cecum, you have a tympany or a cecal impaction. Torsion, everything looks up in a mess. Like your bands running up and down, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell uh, really if it's a torsion. But then your number one differential should be that is this horse having a torsion? Is this horse while in the colicking? Torsion should be high on the differentials. Uh, then, as I said before, uterus. You try torsion should be your another when you have a seven month old pregnant mare or you know usually you see in seven months yeah so the last trimester so you got the third trimester so you got to check that and if it's a uterine torsion you can feel that if it's a clockwise or anti-clockwise the ligaments will be crisscrossing each other usually you get a clockwise well, not usually but higher people have the higher percentage of clockwise than anti-clockwise torsion uh, and um, if there's a small colon impaction, then you feel that the small colon is impacted with contents. Now, the one that you don't want to feel is uh, when you feel that's big vacuum and you feel that's something that's normal, like gritty feeling, like crepitus, it's a rupture. It's a rupture, which is, which is basically uh, the horse has uh, asked for a death sentence because there's nothing which you can do about it. And this you can diagnose by uh, when you do an abdominal, uh, abdominal ultrasound, you see hyperechogenic fluid. Most probably you had uh, uh, you have a, a rupture of the colon or stomach, and to 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 make your diagnosis even more sure, what you would do is the abdominal synthesis, which I will be discussing with you. Gajendra has said that uh, we are feeding hordes per semen para with small quantity of concentrate still in current case called cotorsion primarily called the stomach. Can you please guide on the probable cause? Well, I wouldn't be able to tell that unless I see what you feed them, but then most probably it's your diet. I mean, uh, I can't say because you don't use parsim and para, so I wouldn't be able to tell you what the actual cause. Uh, if uh, fecal output normal, if fecal output normal, which colic? Uh, I would say if fecal output is normal, uh, let's say this way that nothing is blocked in the colon, yeah, or nothing is uh, entrapped. Or nothing is displaced. I would usually you'd say that something like um, like 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 a, either an enteritis proximally or a gastric impaction, most probably. Right. So uh, once you get the manual, which is another part of your diagnosis, if there's blood, usually uh, there are two reasons that you can have blood from bleeding from the gastrointestinal tract, which we can uh, check using a kit called the Succeed. It helps in telling you uh, if the blood is coming from the stomach or from the later part of the gastrointestinal tract, basically the colon. Uh, or the second incidence where you can have blood is when you have a rectal tear, either from a person who's done it before or from your hand. Should be unfortunate. Um, then obviously, as I mentioned before, in the sand colic, you can take, or if you want to check the sand, take the feces in a glove, rub it in water, you see sand at the bottom? It's a sand, uh, sand uh, basically sand colic should be high in the different shells. Fecal uh, parasites, do a fecal account, send the diseases to the lab and check for it. What choice of uh, antibiotics, what choice of antibiotics for colic cause with high temperature? Um, you could, uh, well, high temperature, you could use X, which is basically ceftiofer, endofoxacin. Yeah, ceftiofer is something I would use. Penicillin, gentamicin, yeah, you could use that. What to do when seven month pregnant may have torsion? Okay, good question. Ramesh Tiwari has asked. First of all, understand which side is the torsion, clockwise, anti clockwise, depending on the side. By doing an examination, you decide which area of the flank has to be opened. You can do it standing. If the fold is too big and still you can't manage to do it standing, put it on the table. Right. 
uh, also a part of our treatment and also diagnosis is nasal gastric tubing. Why? So um, let's let's first start. How do you, what do you use? Basically, as you can see in the picture, you use a nasal gastric pump and you use a tube. Uh, the tube in our other horse you use 2.5 to 3 meters, while in a four you use a smaller, thinner tube, which is basically 1 to 1.5 meters. Now, when you do a nasal gastric tubing, be extremely careful. Why? Because uh, if you don't pass it through the esophagus, the horse uh, it can easily go into the trachea, and after you pump water, you can drown a horse. And if some, for example, if you're pumping in nasal, if you're, if you're pumping paraffinoid, not good news. Your horse will end up in pneumonia, pneumonia and uh, probably dead. So how do you do that? Uh, you, you pass the tube through the ventral meatus of the nostril, uh, all the way uh, you reach uh, close uh, to the uh, epiglottis. Now you would make the horse swallow the tube. How do you do that? You could push the head slightly downwards so that it stimulates it to swallow. You could do a bit of blowing. As you blow, the horse starts to swallow the tube. Make sure as the tube goes down that you can see it on the left side. On the, on the left side of the horse, as you observe the, uh, the, the jugular furrow, you can see that the tube is passing through. Keep on blowing, and once you reach the stomach, uh, see that you're having contents. If not, be very careful, uh, yet you are not going into the lungs. And if you are into the trachea, uh, the horse trachea, I mean, it's very sensitive, the horse starts coughing. So then you know, basically, you are in the, in the, in the, in the trachea rather than in the esophagus. So be very careful. And also, another way to diagnose, another way to differentiate between these two is that uh, when you go into the trachea, you have no resistance. Actually, it's very easy to go into the trachea. So that's why it's very really tricky. Be very careful. If you're going to the esophagus, you have a bit of resistance. So then you know that you are in the esophagus. Yeah. Uh, the complications that you face uh, while tubing a horse is epistaxis, that is bleeding from the nostril, uh, which is something that you can experience or uh, you, you can encounter. But do tell the owner before you start tubing that there could be blood and, you know, so that they don't panic. For some owners, they start panicking. They say, oh my God, my horse is bleeding to death. They still calm down. This is something that can happen. So do inform them before you start the procedure. Uh, another thing which you don't want to do is basically tube the horse straight into the trachea and have a aspiration pneumonia. So uh, there are a lot of questions coming. What is the practical approach towards gastric decompression in field? Practical approach, uh, sedate the horse and tube. That's, 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 that's the way you would do it. Or you can even twitch them. Uh, so, in any case of toxemia, product, amoxicillin, and cloxacillin, any antibiotics can cause it. Any antibiotics can cause uh, toxemia. If you, uh, if the, like, for example, the, 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 when you give antibiotics, you can kill the good bacteria, and that's the result of that. You can end up in endotoxemia, and that it has happened. So, uh, what are the chronology of and analgesics you are following for continuous colic? I mean, initially, you could start with sedatives, a uh, bit of butrophenol, phenidine. And then you can use a pentafusion, which is basically a combination of uh, painkillers and uh, sedatives. Is endofloxacin safe in horses? Yes, it is. Uh, what's the dosage? So if you're giving uh, endofloxacin IV, you give it at 5 mg per kg. And if you're giving it oral, you give it at 7.5 mg per kg once daily. Be careful when you use endofloxacin in uh, babies. Do not give endofloxacin to younger horses because it uh, affects the, uh, cas uh, the ossification of the cartilages. Yeah? So do not give endofloxacin in young babies. Is sedation required for nasal gastric tubing? Not always. You could, uh, you could uh, start off with twitching. And if the horse is not controllable even with twitch, then go for sedation. Yes. Uh, is use of lignocaine along with IV fluids okay? Yeah, I mean, you, we, do, we do use lidocaine of, in case we have a proximal enteritis. You know, it's it's like a prokinetic. Actually, it's not a prokinetic. Uh, it reduces the in, uh, inflammation of the colon, uh, of the small intestine rather. So then it helps in um, reducing uh, the reflux. How to manage ileus? I will be coming to that. Right. So, um, now, why did I mention nasogastric tubing in the in, in diagnosis? Because uh, once you have tubed the horse, yeah, and you you, are, you have the horse in your stay in the hospital, you check the reflux every now and then to see uh, if there is a blockage in the small intestine, uh, 
and you want based on that you 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 decide if it's a enteritis or is it something that's even more severe so usually in a horse every 4 hours when you do uh, or any hour you do tubing you used to get you get 2 liters or even less anything above 4 liters is significant and when you get uh, like after every 4 hours you get 8 to 10 liters uh, you probably having an anti enteritis uh, or approximately urinary genitis um also uh, when you having stagnant food in the stomach bacchion uh, if when you chew you get very foul smelling and hemorrhagic uh, reflux uh, gastritis should be high in your uh, in your differentials now uh, when you have a high heart rate and you do an ngt if the heart rate drops after your ngt that means that you basically have something that is like a simple lumen obstruction like an ileus yeah so uh, it's something that you need to do a constant uh, decompression right so if it's not dropping after you do an ngt then there's something much more serious there's an impaction somewhere or something even more worse somebody has asked me which nostril do you prefer for passing the tube i would prefer the left nostril why because you can see the left side as i mentioned before uh, you can see the ngt passing and is it just a tube passing so i would prefer the left You can choose the right, but keep an eye. Uh, and what as I said, mentioned before, if you don't tube them regularly, if there is uh, a refluxing or any sort of impaction, you can end up in a meso. Uh, you can end up in a gastric rupture, right? Because horses cannot vomit. Uh, and also, the primary treatment for any colic is passing the nasogastric tube. If you don't do that, that is uh, that's negligence, I would say. Well, on the well, if the horse is non-cooperative and you are in field conditions, okay, I wouldn't push it. But then, uh, use your sedations and uh, use 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 maximum restraint and uh, try to tube the horse because that could be life-saving. Right. The next diagnostic tool that we use quite often is the ultrasonography. Uh, we use the curve probe. Uh, we do it transabdominally. The frequency is usually between 1.7 to 5 megahertz. In foals, you need uh, higher megahertz, higher frequency. Uh, why we do it? Uh, the objectives are: first, you could see uh, the intestinal wall thickness, the gastric size, that is, size of the stomach. As we mentioned before, uh, the horse stomach is between 9 and 13th intercostal space. Now. once the stomach is beyond the 13th or rather beyond the 14th intercostal space you start thinking of a gastric impaction or a gastric distension could be from fluid or could be from from from, from the food that's been sitting there so that's why you know when you do an ultrasound if the, if the stomach size the stomach wall is beyond the 14th intercostal space start thinking there is something wrong there and the reason is to check the small intestinal distension as we mentioned before uh, in proximal enteritis or other things uh, you know we need to see if this distant the small intestinal loops uh, then the peritoneal fluid uh, then you go to or when you when you do uh, the 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 uh, nephrospinic entrapment the classic signs that you would see on the left side next to the kidney large colon or small small intestine sitting there so when you see that you know it's kind of an entrapment or a displacement uh then in cases where you can see intersusception as i mentioned before where you can see bullseye so that, that that's for finding lesions yeah uh, however this technique has its own limitations that it cannot penetrate uh, gas with so that when there's a gas so as you know ultrasound is based on the on the density of the tissue when there's gas there is no tissue so your your, your waves don't penetrate beyond that so and also it's the, the the you can only see the top structures you can't see the deep structures so that's how the you can maximum see it, uh, 6 to 12 inches the rest you can't somebody asked how is renal colic differentiated uh, the renal colic basically uh, you basically it's a colic but then if you rule out other things and you do a blood work you most probably have higher values of creatinine and things like that so then you kind of think this is a renal colic which we which we rarely get most of the colics are from gastrointestinal origin right so uh, i'm going to show you a couple of uh, images of a uh, of of of, of uh, ultrasonography you know the classic areas where we do ultrasound in a horse so let's start with the left abdomen now uh, here i'm trying to look at the stomach as i mentioned before the stomach is one of the things that you look initially is it distended or 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 um,
You are now unmuted. You are now muted. You are now unmuted. Okay, good. You are now muted. Yeah, am I audible now? You are now unmuted. Mm -hmm. Am I audible? Is it you are now muted. Uh, breaking or okay? You are now unmuted. You are now muted. You are now unmuted. You are now muted. Hello. You are now unmuted. Yeah. Is it clear? Okay. Shall I go ahead? Okay. So um, the ultrasound of the abdomen. Now let's start with the left side. Now uh, the left side, as I said, the one thing that you want to look is the gastric size. Usually, uh, the stomach is located between the 9th and the 13th intercoastal space at the level of the shoulder. Now, what you see in this picture is the greater curvature of the stomach. Uh, the stomach, how do you differentiate? It's, it's got a very thick wall. Uh, usually, uh, it's around 0 0.7 millimeters, while a non dyslexic like stomach that's having no content is around 1 centimeter in thickness. So, that's how you know. And next to the stomach, you would see the spleen. And you would see this dark circle, which is called the gastrosplenic vein. So that's how you see the stomach. And then the other thing you see on the right, on the left side, would be uh, looking if there's a nephrosplenic entrapment. How do you do that? Uh, you check for the kidney, which is located in the 16th, which is located from the 16th to 17th intercoastal space to the first or the third lumbar vertebrae. When you look at this space, you'll find the kidney. It's got that, that typical structure, and it's medial to the spleen. Now. You should see spleen very close to the left kidney. If you see that there is colon sitting there, be careful, it's highly suspicious of a left dorsal displacement or rather a nephrosplenic entrapment also. Right. When you come to the right side of the abdomen, uh, the fact, the couple of things that you could look into is uh, uh, you could check the duodenum. Now, the duodenum uh, is located between the liver and the right dorsal colon. Usually it's flattened, um, but sometimes when there's proper distension, you could see them as, as big round, but uh, normally, yeah, you don't see them as, as clearly, but then that's something that you can look into. Uh, other thing you can look also is uh, you could scan the colon on the, on the right side, and you could have the right dorsal colon and the right ventral colon. How do you differentiate? The way you do that is to look into the colon wall thickness. Like for example, when you have a colitis. So how do you, how do you, how do you differentiate? The right dorsal colon, you see a single line, while the right ventral colon has saturations. Also, when you do the right side of the abdomen on the ventral aspect, if you see mesenteric vessels, very highly suspicious of a right dorsal displacement. Mesenteric vessels, right side, ventrally, very high, highly suspicious of a right dorsal displacement, which we could check using doing a rectum. And uh, then, yeah, you can decide your treatment based on that. Right. Uh, yeah, so these are the, these are the,
findings that you can sometimes have, like abnormal, like as I mentioned before, you have small intestinal distension where these small intestines look like big grapes or oranges, like more than five centimeters. Uh, then you can have an intersusception, which is basically like a bullseye. And also, as I mentioned, when you check the colon wall, if it's edematous, as you see in the picture, you have uh, basically a colon wall edema. It's thickened. Yeah. Right. Radiology. So. Yeah, you know, we don't use this, we don't use it at all because we don't have such a powerful machine. But we usually use it for finding for diagnosing sand and intro lits. Uh, but uh, doesn't mean that we do a radiograph that we don't see any sand. That there's no sand. Uh, but in places where they have a lot of sand colics, uh, they do have a very powerful machine to diagnose it. So that's how it looks. We don't use it in our practice. Okay, so blood. So one of the most important things, more important factors that we check when you do a colic. As you see in the picture, that's the machine they use, uh, we use rather, uh, it's called an ice stack machine. So what you do is you take a couple of uh, mLs of blood, you have a cartridge, depending on what you want to check. Like uh, what we use is what they call the EC8 and the CG4. So from the EC8 cartridge, what we can do is we can find the hydration status, the pH, the electrolytes, uh, the base excess. Uh, while when you use, uh, you can also check uh, the blood gas. While we use the CG4, you can check the blood gas and also the lactate levels, which is another pattern which I will be discussing. Right. These are important important factors that we look uh, when we diagnose uh, colic and when we decide what type of treatment needs to be done. Right. Now, uh, what what all we can expect in a horse that's suffering from colic? Dehydration, obviously, because one is it's been losing a lot of fluid either by sweating from diarrhea hasn't drunk enough of water in those cases you see that the pcd is about 45 percent you get hyperglycemia it's one of the classic findings because uh, the horse is uh, using up all its glucose reserve because of the colic because of the pain the release of cortisol uh, then you have hypocalcemia decreased calcium levels uh, this they attribute is uh, basically due to uh, Uh, am I audible now? Hello. You are now unmuted. Yeah, is it okay? Is it good? I, am I audible? Yeah, okay, so hypocalcy.
Hello? Is it good? Yeah. I think it's breaking again, is it? Okay, 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 okay. So, uh, hypocalcemia, as I mentioned, the real reason being endotoxemia and ischemia. Hypokalemia, you get also is because uh, the horse hasn't been eating, it's basically anorexic. And there is typing somebody. Is is anorexic and also when you have diarrhea you tend to lose of potassium and that's why that's why uh, you get hypocalcemia hypokalemia right i'm just waiting for what uh, the admin has to say okay i think it's fine yeah okay okay good good good, good. okay so um the next, uh, another, another thing you could see is hypomagnesemia. The reason for this is not really clear, but they also assume it's due to endotoxemia that's uh, associated with the uh, colics. Uh, you don't see any abnormalities with the sodium or potassium ions, except in case of uh, diarrhea where the sodium concentration decreases and the chloride increases. Now, usually in a colic, you get to see metabolic acidosis, but you can also have metabolic alkalosis. But there's no reason why it should be that or this. You when you get when you, you they use they say usually when you have an impaction you get to see metabolic acidosis, but more metabolic acidosis uh, than metabolic uh, alkalosis. Uh, then also you get to uh, prenatal acetemia, acetemia. That's basically because of the dehydration. Right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, uh, no. okay, am I clear now? Okay, the next factor that we are looking into is uh, the lactate levels. Now, uh, I have just shown you a cycle of the lactate, how lactate is produced called the Cody cycle. As you know, the lactate is a uh, right. Just a minute. Just a minute. Okay, the lactate is a byproduct of uh, glycolysis and uh, usually it happens as a result in anaerobic conditions, anaerobic metabolism, and uh, usually happens secondary to tissue hypoxia. Now, why uh, is this important? When you have a lesion that is strangulating lesion, a lesion that is, uh, causes a decreased flow of blood, uh, the tissue there undergoes anaerobic metabolism and your lactate increases. Now, how is it a marker? So, the longer the tissue undergoes uh, anaerobic metabolism or ischemia, uh, the lactate level keeps on rising, which is an indicate, which is an indicator of the prognosis, right? So how do you measure lactate? You could either use the blood or the abdominal fluid. Normal values are below two millimoles per liter. Uh, it's been seen that horses with greater than 11.2 millimoles have a poor prognosis compared with horses uh, having zero and 8.3. But I would say anything about two millimoles, be careful. Use you need to keep an eye. What I would recommend is once you get a horse that's about two, uh, you could start hydrating the horse. Check them, check the lactate again one or two hours time. If it keeps on climbing, you have an issue. While if it starts dropping or rather stays stagnant, uh, you could bet that it was most probably from the dehydration caused as a result of uh, the colic. But you know, if it keeps on climbing, you are most probably having a colic that uh, would need a surgical intervention. And uh, uh, how would you know it that is that when you check, when you compare the blood and the abdominal lactate levels, if your difference is going higher, obviously the condition is worsening. If it stays normal or it drops, it means the condition is improving. Yeah. So lactate is a very good marker. Uh, but mind you, I'm going to tell you an incidence of my, my personal experience. Uh, I had a case that came with uh, a colic and uh, we, we, we have got a lactate of two and uh, the lactate stayed fairly constant but in another four years time when I checked it, it shot up to six and that was a case of epiploic foramen entrapment. Why? Because the blood picture was not an accurate, but since it's an entrapment, you don't get a proper picture of the, of, of the peritoneal lactate levels. So don't completely depend your diagnosis on lactate. Uh, rather keep it as one of the modalities that you, you are checking. So somebody in Bhairavi has asked me, can you repeat what's improving or worsening? The lactate levels. So lactate goes high, your condition is worsening, prognosis goes down, your lactate goes to, uh, gets better or rather the, the, the value decreases, your horse is improving treatment.
right? Uh, you can do lactate using whole blood. Yeah. Right. There's something called lactate meter, lactome, lactate meter. Yeah, we use the lactate meter uh, for checking the lactate. Right. So uh, someone asked about uh, abdominal synthesis. How do you do it? This is the procedure. So you have a horse in a stock. Uh, you restrain the horse. You can either sedate the horse or use a twitch. Uh, the side that you generally use is on the right side, two centimeters away from the midline, the linea alba. You prepare a square area. Basically, before doing this procedure, try to do an ultrasound. And if you have an area that's got a fluid accumulation, basically it's going to be uh, the, 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 the part that's closest to the uh, the closest to gravity, the bottommost part. So that's where most probably you have fluid accumulation. And you you, you clip the area, prepare the area aseptically. Uh, do a local block using lidocaine. Uh, then push your needle all the way inside uh, into the musculature and drop in some more of your uh, lido. And then use a 15, 15, 15 uh, size blade. Create a small incision, small stab. Then using a cannula, you push your uh, cannula through the incision that you have made using your, your blade. You push, push, push perpendicular to the body wall and. Uh, once you hear a popping sound, that's basically your boy have entered the peritoneum. That's when you have done a proper uh, puncture. So you have to really give a bit more, bit more of pressure when you do this, the abdominal synthesis. Right. So you can, you can, you can push. Your, sometimes you might not get the, enough of fluid. So you know, retract your your, your, your candle a bit. So we position it again to get a bit of fluid. Sometimes. Unfortunately, it can go wrong. You can penetrate the intestine or spleen, but usually we don't get that very rarely. It can happen, but don't worry. The horse is not going to die. You could immediately put the horse on uh, broad spectrum antibiotics and it uh, shouldn't be a problem. And after, once you get the fluid out of, out of, out of uh, the abdomen, you can analyze it for TB, WBC, and also the color. Once you have removed, once you have removed your, your, your cannula, please press the area using a sterile 4x4 so that uh, you prevent the formation, you prevent the blood from dripping and or any infection going in. Uh, I have a small video before we go into the values. Uh, This is how we do an abdominal synthesis. Make a stab incision, preferably using a 15 blade. There you go with the cannula. Keep on pushing it till you hear the popping sound. There you go. Wait till you get the peritoneal fluid. Reposition your tube if you don't get it. And there you go. Right. Right. So, uh, in a normal, uh, we call abdominal tap. Your color is usually of the of the fluid is usually yellow and clear. Uh, your total protein is less than two point five, and if you measure the lactate, is basically less than two point two two millimoles per liter. Now these pictures that you see is progressively bad. The the uh, the number four is reasonably okay, while number two and six is horrifically bad. Then you know your prognosis is even worse. So try to do always an abdominal synthesis possible to have a different to have a clear diagnosis if you need to go into surgery or not right you can do a leukocyte count and check uh, the neutrophil synthetic but basically look at the color and uh, check the total protein and also if possible the lactate someone asked Ramesh has asked me comparison of lactate what intervals and how many times uh, you could do it depending on how how severe a case you could do it every two hours or every four hours generally we do it every four hours but if we're suspecting something really bad we do it every two hours yeah, a question for you. What do you think about this abdominal synthesis? Anybody has any diagnosis? What must have happened? 
What is it? Yeah, Jack, <laughs> pretty much. So it's, it's, it could, could be a rupture. It's a highly successful rupture. Could be the colon, could be the stomach, uh, not the bladder. Uh, why that's cloudy is because there's been a lot of compromise and ischemia, hence your fluid has been very really cloudy. But if you look carefully at the bottom, you have some sediments. That could be the food or could be the stomach contents or could be sand. So basically, that's a very poor prognosis. When you have food particles coming out, you're pretty sure that uh, your horse has ruptured. And uh, yeah, that's calling for euthanasia. Right, good. Uh, gastroscopy is another modality you can use, but then we don't use in case of acute colics because trust me, you, it's not one of your priorities. But then once you have done the initial treatments and uh, you uh, have got the horse under control and you're suspecting that he has gastritis as a primary problem or a secondary problem, you could do it later in the day or the next day. I mean, and you basically get to see the stomach and sometimes the, the duodenum. Right, but it's not really necessary as the initial part of your diagnosis. Which comes to the treatment part of a colic. Okay. So what are the basic principles for, or maybe basic goals for treating a colic? Number one, relieving pain. Number two, correcting physiological imbalance. Number three, stimulating or maintaining intestinal transit. Number four, decreasing intestinal inflammation. So these are your major goals for treating a colic. And obviously, when necessary, you do surgery uh, to relieve uh, strangulation or a simple uh, obstruction. So one of the main techniques, as I mentioned before, is nasogastric tubing. Uh, when you put the tube to the nostril to the stomach, you remove the impaction or the reflux. In case of proximal enteritis, you need to do it every two to three hours because, as I said before, the small intestine inflamed, there is a reflux, you need to empty that. If not, it starts building up and the horse uh, starts having again colic. So, you need to decompress it every two to three hours. The other decompression technique that we can use is cecal function or enterosynthesis. Now, we do this only when you do a rectum and you're suspecting the cecum is having a tympani. Uh, I find this technique very successful because uh, once you have a lot of space in the abdomen, sometimes the colon falls back into place. So once you decompress the stomach and you feel there's a cecal tympani, you can do this technique. It's called cecal, uh, cecal decompression. So how you do it? You basically do it in the right right paralumbar fossa because the cecum is on the right side. Yeah, you do it between the last strip and the, when the prominence of the tubercoxae. What you do is, first of all, you clear the area, you, you clean it completely, you shave it, preferably shave the area, clean it, scrub it, clean it, uh, like before you put a blep, and uh, then, uh, if possible, to make a small incision using a 15 uh, blade, then you introduce a 14 to 16 gauge needle, right, and you go straight into the cecum. Okay, am I audible now? Okay, good.
Yeah. Am I audible now? Uh, am I audible now? Okay, uh, am I audible? Oh, your catheter infused antibiotics which you can use is penicillin. Oh, this is frustrating. Okay, am I clear now? Okay, so as you withdraw your catheter or your needle, uh, start infusing antibiotics like penicillin or gentamicin. And uh, yeah, because this is done just to make sure that you don't uh, leave any contaminants, right? So that is sequel function. Right, so let's go into the drugs. What are the drugs that you prefer? What are the drugs that you use basically for treating a colic? Uh, so initial, when you get a colic, you can, you need to control them and you need to give them painkillers. Uh, so one of the drugs we prefer is alpha-2 agonist, basically xylazine, bromifidine, domocidine, or detomidine. The aim of these, giving these drugs are the analgesia, muscle relaxation, and sedation. But uh, the side effects also include like hypotension, uh, bradycardia, ileus, uh, diuresis. So yeah, these are side effects, but then I think still, uh, the benefits outweigh the side effects. Uh, I mentioned the dosages. Xylazine, you give it at 0 0.4 to 2 mg. Basically, what I use uh, 1 mg per kg uh, IV. Romifidine, you can give 0 0.8 ml per 100 kilos. Uh, Domocidin, you use 10 to 20 microgram per kg. Uh, that's roughly, you can give 0 0.1 ml for every 100 kilos. The detomidine, 0 0.1 ml for 100 kilos. So you can basically give 0 0.4 ml to a 400 kilohertz, the determine. The drug that you should prefer is xylazine. Right. Which concentration of romotridine? It's 100 mg per ml, the 10% one. A xylazine resistant uh, is surgical colic, is it right? Uh, well, not really. Well, uh, you can uh, you can first, first once you get the horse control, you have to, you have to empty the stomach. Yeah, and then once you have done your other part, see, giving a painkiller is a diagnostic tool because if he's comfortable, well, you might have a colleague that's responsive. If he's not comfortable, then you still need to uh, do your treatment part of it, like you know, emptying the stomach, uh, decompression, and stuff like that. And if still, if he's, if the horse is uh, not responsive, then you might start thinking in the direction of surgery. Yeah. Uh, the other drug is opioids, so you could use, uh, we generally use butrophenol. Uh, we combine it, it uh, usually with the xylazine if the horse is really painful. 
uh, we give the dose of 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 mg per kg. Uh, do not cross the high, don't give a high dose because it can cause an increase in heart rate and uh, systolic blood pressure and also it can cause excitation horses. One of our favorite drugs, buscopan. Yeah, so uh, you can you have buscopan as such, which is basically hyoscine butyl bromide, or you have compositum, which is one that we use, which contains also uh, metamizol, which is a, an effective painkiller. Uh, it, it it reduces the spasms, and usually used for spasmodic colics and uh, impactions. Now, the good thing about buscopan is that uh, even though it relieves the pain, it does not have a long half life. So what happens if your horse is not so you get a colic? And the hormone monitor, so what can I give the horse to know if it's a bad colic or what can do initial treatment? We always tell them, give buscopan. And if the horse is not responsive, that means in say another half an hour, one of the horse again colicking, you need to bring the horse to the hospital. If the horse is fine after one or two hours, then you're, you know, you must probably have a spasmodic colic, which, which is like a differential diagnosis saying that, okay, it is not a bad colic. Well, if it doesn't respond to buscopan, get a wet immediately or drive the horse to the, drive the, horse to the hospital. The dosage basically what we use is 5 ml for 100 kilos. So roughly a 400 kilo horse would need 20 ml uh, IV. It's one of our favorite drugs. NSA IDs, yeah, painkillers. So um, as you know, they, 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 they function by inhibiting the production of prostaglandin, and uh, which is one of the reasons of causing stomach ulcers and uh, renal problems. Uh, the usual one that we use is flunexin. We can use metamizol also. As I mentioned before, uh, it can cause ulceration, necrosis, uh, also a huge dosage or continuous dosage can cause uh, right dorsal colitis. Now, here's a tip for you. The usual dosage of Flunex is 1.1 mg per kg. Yeah. What we generally recommend is to, if your horse, if the owner doesn't have uh, uh, buscopan, what we tell them is give half a dose of phenidine. Don't give the full dose. And if the horse is still non-responsive colleagues, again, you need to bring the horse immediately. Don't, don't give the full dose. Because if you the, give the full dose, the, the condition keeps on getting worse. What I mean is, you're masking just the pain while the condition has got worse. And by the time you get the horse to the hospital, it's already started becoming a surgical colic, or even worse, it's gone. It's not, uh, it's not correctable even after a surgical colic. So uh, yeah, be very careful when you give flunix into a horse. If you're sure what you're doing, like if it's an impaction, fine. You know what you're doing, but if not, start with half doses and see how the horse responds to it. If it's not, then most probably you have a, you need to dig in deeper and or most probably it's a surgical colic. Someone asked me the green if it's in dose. It's, it's basically a bottle. Yeah, we use a 500 bottle. Uh, we don't use it for colics. No, we don't use it for colic surgeries. We use it for minor surgeries, uh, like a castration or something as a minor procedure. Uh, even single dose cause gastritis. I don't know what. Uh, not a single dose. No, 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 not a single dose. A repeated dose. A repeated dose causes gastritis. Mm. Post xylazine ileus. Doesn't really cause a lot of ileus. Please don't use it continuously. Right? Uh, at the gender, I think you asked me a question of post xylazine ileus. Don't use it continuously. Uh, well, ileus treatment, I'm coming to. The treatment for ileus, I'm going to, I'm going to come to that. Prokinetic drugs. So, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, these drugs are used in cases of uh, proximal uh, entritis, like duodenal jejunitis. Uh, well, the first drug that we prefer using is lidocaine. So, uh, it's got an analgesic and an anti inflammatory uh, effect. So, what you do is you give a loading dose of 1.3 mg per kg as a bolus over five minutes, rather, five to 15 minutes, do very slowly. And then this should be followed by a dosage of 0.05 mg per kg per minute IV infusion for 24 hours or even more. Yeah, so this is how you give the lidocaine. First, you give us initial bolus and then you give it as a CRI, constant rate infusion. And uh, this is useful in cases where you're suspecting uh, proximal enteritis. Now, this has side effects that can have muscle fasciculations, ataxia, uh, and seizures. So be very careful in playing with this drug. If you give a higher dose, your cap cost is basically collapsing sometimes, yeah? Uh, metaclopamide is another drug that we like to use. We give it at a dosage of uh, 0, 0 0.04 mg per kg subcut. 
Uh, I don't recommend using this ID because you can have extra pyramidal effects and you can have sometimes horses climbing up the wall. So be careful when you use this ID. Rather use a subcut 0.04 mg per kg subcut. Very effective. Uh, as I said, it can cause CNS CNS excitement. So be very careful. Erythromycin is another drug uh, that we use for, uh, but no, no, actually, no, we don't use it to be fine. So we don't use it, uh, so be very careful if you end up uh, having diarrhea with this drug. So, but still, it's kind of broken and tricked on. And also, you can, because of the cramping, as a result of this drug, you can have uh, abdominal pain. Right. Uh, so next comes to the most important part. After the drugs, or besides the drugs, you have to, uh, your horse is basically dehydrated and you need to restore the circulating fluids and the electrolytes as a result of the colic. So a normal horse, you give them two ml per kg per hour. That's basically 40 mg, 40 ml per kg per day to 60. Uh, while when you are giving a horse that's having a colic, try to double the volume, yeah? So uh, you can roughly give uh, 1.52 liters per hour, yeah? And uh, because you need to hydrate the horse and also manage uh, the ongoing losses. How do you how do you check for the dehyd the hydration status? Check the gums, uh, the skin tending, uh, and also by checking the blood, by checking the PCD, the total protein. Uh, the fluids that normally use are lactate drinkers, uh, normal salt that is normal saline, hypertonic saline, and uh, colloids such as plasma, eta starch, and uh, dextrins. So hyper, when do we use hypertonic saline? No, when you get a horse that's having a PCV of 45% or rather more, we use hypertonic saline. Uh, what it does is it, it, it helps in the movement of the water from the intravascular space into the interstitial, so that helps in hydrating the horse. The dosage that is 2 ml per kg to 4 ml per kg. Make sure that after you lose, immediately follow this by giving them isotonic fluids, roughly 8, 10 liters of whatever. But do make sure, because what you have done is you have sucked out all the fluids into the blood, to, 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 to increase the volume, but then make sure that you don't dehydrate also. You have to immediately give this. Uh, it's this, uh, that's what I mentioned, like you give uh, double the dose, like usually for a horse you give 2 ml per kg, so make it 4 ml per kg, yeah? And that's roughly 1.5 to 2 liters per hour, uh, depending on how much of losses you have. Uh, if you have, uh, if your horse is refluxing, what I would recommend is add one more liter to that, because you want to, uh, meet with the losses. Uh, you can use oral fluids, yes, I'll be coming to that oral rehydration. Uh, then you might, you might have electrolyte disturbances. So what you do is, uh, like when you're having an acidic, a case that's having uh, acidosis, yeah, uh, the sodium bicarbonate level decreases. So what you do is calculate the sodium bicarb, calculate using 0 0.3 into body weight into the base excess, which we have received using ISTAT. Initially, give half the dose and check Check, check again your blood value. If it's improving, stop there. If not, continue doing uh, your bicarbs. Uh, as you mentioned before, another 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 problem that we face is uh, uh, hypocalcemia, and uh, we can give one bottle of uh, calcium monogluconate, which is twenty percent solution. We give that to horses. Yeah, that is soda bicarb. That's what we're doing. Um, I just asked me soda bicarb. That's ID actually. Sorry, I didn't mention that, yeah. Sorry, that's uh, that's ID dosage. What is base excess? Good question. Base excess uh, is, uh, it, it, technically it means the amount of acid bring it back to the normal pH at a certain uh, pressure of carbon dioxide. Yeah, it's very technical. And uh, basically it means how much of electrolyte imbalance is there. So if you're having a negative, so a normal force, uh, base excess will range from you know plus five to minus five, you're kind of okay. But the moment it goes over like above minus five, like minus six, you're having an acidosis, above plus five, you're having an alkalosis. And based on that, you need to decide what fluid are you going to use, either a linear lactate or a normal slide. Right. So, and if you're having a hypo hypomagnesemia, you could give magnesium sulfate or magnesium chloride at two mg per kg. Uh, only and uh, also you could also use magnesium oxide. What we generally do is that we use a uh, uh, medicine called a biodine, very effective for hypomagnesemia. We add it to the fluids and uh, that kind of corrects the.
You are now unmuted. You are now muted. You are now unmuted. Oh, hello, is it good? Yeah, so you yeah, that's how you do uh, magnesium. Uh, you are now unmuted. You are now muted. Uh, audible. You are now unmuted. Yeah, continue. Yeah. So someone asked me about the old. You are now muted. Hello. You are now unmuted. You are now muted. Is good. You are now unmuted. Shall I? Yeah, shall I go ahead? You are now muted. Is it good? You are now unmuted. Yeah, the enteral fluid therapy. So someone asked about uh, about uh, giving oral fluids. So you can give it as bolus, or uh, you can give it a continuous fashion uh, uh, through the lip. You have an empty stomach, rather stomach having contents less than two liters. Yeah. So be careful about that. And uh, what you could do is you could give them six to eight liters of water. With mixed with electrolytes, what we have is sachets of electrolytes that have been prepared, and you can add them to the water and uh, you could give that. And uh, if at all you want to uh, give some magnesium sulfate, you could uh, mix that separately with the water, but uh, give that one gram per kg. What we do is basically we get 0 0.5 grams per kg, and uh, we give it one or maximum twice, don't overdo it. Yeah, and this technique is useful for uh, basically for, in, for dealing with impactions, right. So some of the uh, ileus, I think you asked me how do we treat an ileus like proximal enteritis. So mainstay, obviously, fluid therapy, because you want to maintain, you want to, uh, someone has asked me, can we do rectal dose of fluid therapy? Don't, don't, there's no need. Any dextrose containing fluids? Not necessarily, you can, yes, good question, you could. If you see your glucose is dropping, yeah, you could, because um, another problem in horses, not always that you could face, which is in many many ponies, is hyperlipidemia. So you could uh, you could uh, spike your fluids with uh, dextrose, fifty percent. But be very careful when using dextrose in horses; uh, it can induce laminitis. What is the rate of infusion? Calcium borogluconate. Uh, we we added to the drip, so I can't tell you the infusion rate because I don't know what speed we do. But it's it's the speed of the fluid spike, which is basically one uh, to two. Uh, well, 1.5 to 2 liters per hour. We have no complications because of that. So we just started with the bags, Pasuda. Yeah. So um, let's, yeah, the ileus. So ileus, basically, you're losing fluids. So you need to give uh, fluids through IV. Uh, do not give fluids orally or enterally uh, through nasal gastric tube. Why? Because uh, nothing is going past the stomach. Yeah, uh, definitely do gastric decompression because you have the fluid is accumulating into the stomach from the small intestine. Uh, use anti endotoxic drugs, uh, or you could use polymyxin B at a dosage of 6,000 international units IV. Uh, 
uh, every eight to twelve hours. It's a very expensive drug, so you know, uh, if the horse is very important and the owner can afford it, why not? Uh, then you could use flunacin megalumin. Now, flunacin megalumin, even though it's a painkiller, uh, in this situation we use it as an anti-endotoxic drug. How do we do it? Usually, those age of flunacin is 1.1 mg per kg. When you have a, a horse that is flunacin for anti-endotoxic therapy, you give it at 0.25 mg per kg. I repeat, 0.25 mg per kg, that's quarter the dose. So you do it every six hours. Yeah, so that's the anti-endotoxic dosage for uh, flunexin. You could give uh, pentoxifilin, which is an, an, another uh, drug for endotoxemia. Uh, lidocaine, definitely. Uh, we give plasma, because uh, we've got a lot of double disease. We manufacture our own plasma at the hospital. So we have plasma at the hospital. Uh, you could give heparin. It's something that uh, also can be done. Uh, we high molecular weight heparin we need to give subcutaneously. And uh, one thing you've got to be very careful on dealing with horses with ileus is that uh, they are susceptible for laminitis. Be very careful. So once you have ileus, straight away start with uh, laminitis treatment, prevent laminitis, uh, basically by icing the feet. Uh, and then you can't feed the horse, obviously not, because the horse is sort of flexing what he eats, and uh, icing the feet uh, and cushion, uh, cushion the stable 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 flowing or add more shakes uh, but definitely keep on checking the, the the feet because they are highly susceptible to laminitis those are apparent uh, i have no idea pentoxifen is 8 mg per kg you give it four mg pentoxifen apparent uh, good question i can't remember that anymore uh, we seldom use apparent not always but it's, it's a very useful drug. Uh, why also another complication that you can have from ileus is uh, thrombophobitis, a very bad complication. Yeah, and uh, to prevent that, you can you can you can use uh, heparin as a uh, I'm sorry, Raj, I don't have the dosage with me at present. Uh, I can give it to you once I once away if I can find it. Unfortunately, I don't remember the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, also, someone asked me how do you treat impaction. So, as, you, as, as we know, impaction is one of the types of colic. It can either happen in the pelvic flexure or the right dorsal corner. So, initial treatment is elevating the pain. So, you can use xylazine, detromidine, uh, buscopan, uh, flunexin to, 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 to elevate the pain. If the horse is still painful, you know, that means he is probably surgery. Now, what treatments otherwise you can do is start with enteral fluids. Uh, give a mineral oil while it is a gastric tube. Uh, you basically give five liters every four to five hours if the impaction is resolved. Uh, you can give magnesium sulfate, as we discussed before, at around one gram per kg, uh, but do it only once or twice in a day. Don't do much beyond that. You can also uh, add uh, sodium sulfate, also, it's one gram per kg, and then this helps in hydrating the colon contents. So what you could do is you could either make magnesium sulfate 0.5 gram per kg along with 0.5 gram per kg of sodium sulfate, mix it and give it. You can do a combination or you can do it separately. Yeah. Uh, also, when you do the whole rehydration, in case you don't have a proper electrolyte mixture, you can make your own by, by how frequently you can you use xylazine. Uh, not very frequently. I wouldn't recommend xylazine. It's just to elevate the initial uh, I wouldn't use xylazine, I would rather use uh, phenidine and buscopan, not xylazine. By xylazine, I would use a steel when the horse is unbearably painful and the owner has no option for surgery. Yeah, that's why I would use xylazine. Xylazine is not my first preference. Yeah. Uh, so, what you could do is use uh, electrolyte solution by adding uh, table salt, potassium chloride, and uh, sodium bicarbonate, and you can make your electrolyte mixture uh, for hydrating the impaction. Uh, nephrospin can travel. Again, we discussed this before, but we were not specific about the dosage. So, uh, nephrospin can travel. Once you have it, you can do flu therapy, you use a bit of painkillers to relieve the pain. But one of the major drugs that you have to use or you could use is phenylephrine. As we mentioned, so it causes splenic constriction and then the colon falls back in place. How you do it is you calculate the dose, how much the horse needs. It's basically 3 microgram per kg. Uh, you need to calculate and dilute in one liter normal saline. Give it over 15 minutes. 
yeah be careful when you give this uh, you have to check if the horse uh, heart rate is increasing so so you have to yeah you have to keep a close eye and do not give horses that are 50, over 15 years of age you could cause a splenic rupture yeah so once you give uh, the the uh, free, you need to lunge the horse immediately like for 20 minutes lunging because once the spleen is contracted then it helps the gut to fall back in place yeah and if this is also not successful you could try the rolling technique so what you basically do is uh, let the horse lie down on lateral recumbency with the uh, left side up yeah and then you you well the horse is anesthetized huh? not, not the horse is uh, like live and kicking you can't do that you anesthetize the horse and then you slowly rock, rock them to the right side uh to, yeah from, from one side to the other you rock them so with the left side upwards you rock them to the other side and then you do a rectum and then if you find that it's fallen back in place then okay if not then uh, a colic surgery might be needed Right, so a message. Dicyclomin. What is the suggested relative dicyclomin? Uh, I don't know what dicyclomin is, uh, the gender, I'm sorry. Is that lunch the horse? Yeah, so you are lunging the horse, basically. Is ketoprofen effective? Yeah, you could, you could use ketoprofen. I mean, it's also a painkiller analgesic, but we don't. Uh, we prefer phenixin or any sort of analgesic. Give only once. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, the finale thing, you can repeat it, but not immediately. Yeah? You repeat it after half a day is finished, then you repeat the finale thing and uh, then do the lunging. Yeah. Usually it's, it's, it's. I have no idea what dicyclomin is. I'm sorry, I have no idea. Delete. No idea. Uh, I've never used that truck. Pass moment. What does it contain? Is that, is that the trade name of. Uh, uh, is that the trade name of uh, dicyclomin? I have now used it. But, okay. Yeah, so um, let's come to the uh, surgery, which is your <laughs> last option, or uh, some cases the best option because you don't want to waste time doing medical treatment. Uh, so wait, somebody has asked me how to check if the first injection of phenylephrine, I guess, is helpful. Do a rectal again and do a, 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 a what do you call a, a ultrasound. And if you feel that the nephrospin space is empty and ultrasound you don't have colon, your your finale feeling worked. Yeah. So that's how we check it. Uh, so surgery, when do you do a surgery? Basically, if the horse is extremely painful, uh, you see the heart rate is quite high, like about 80, definitely hot horse. Or 60 to 80, you're, you're thinking of surgery already when the heart rate is at that at that at that rate. Then uh, if you give painkillers, horse is not responsive, surgery. Uh, then you have, as I said, distant and small distant loops. Oh, you know, when you really see that, you're like, okay, uh, probable case of uh, surgery, but then you should differentiate if it's uh, ileus uh, or not. Uh, then check the peritoneal fluid. If you have fluid that is very, very turbid or rather going towards zero sanguinous, definitely something is compromised. Surgery. Uh, lactate, we discussed it before. Anything about two millimole per liter start being suspicious and uh, as it increases, yeah, surgery, surgery. Uh, then, uh, as I mentioned, if your fluid therapy or medical treatment is not successful, the horse is getting worse, you need to surgery. Uh, if you think there's an intestine strangulation, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, and you, you are, your horse is still painful or the, the, the clinical signs are getting worse, you need to think about surgery. Uh, pelvic flexure impactions, you have been treating for two to three days and you're not, you're, you're, you're not improving the condition of the horse, then definitely, uh, definitely surgery is... Uh, higher on the list and also for diagnostic purposes i mean beyond treatment like uh, you don't know what the actual problem is you know, it, surgery is uh, recommended uh, but please keep in mind as you as the time passes the progress of the surgery uh, or the survival for the horse is uh, decreasing so uh, earlier you did detect the problem and if the surgery was the treatment recommended better your prognosis so that always keep in mind. So if you have a owner that's ready to spend money and uh, he, he he really cares for the horse, and if you think so, let's say go for it. Don't wait because the more you wait, uh, yeah, the the the, the poor the prognosis. Right. So actually, you know, there's no certain factor that tells you how bad the prognosis is. Even though certain things like uh, the, the 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 lactate, you know, tells you it's 
poor prognosis. You can't predict accurately the hospital survive post surgery or not. So even though they are they are uh, they are certain meters of telling if the horse is going to do well, if the horse needs surgery, post surgery you can't predict what's going to happen. Even the best surgeries can have complications. So hernia, laminitis, adhesions. So you can have a lot of problems. And as I mentioned, the earlier the surgery, the better the prognosis. So make the owner know that if you want a good outcome and if you think surgery is the, it's the way out of this, do recommend surgery straight away. And it's up to him to decide if he wants to take now or then, now or later. But do make him understand that the more he waits, the prognosis is poor. Um, then, um, and in some cases, you know, you feel that the condition is untreatable. Uh, like, for example, it's a rupture. You know, there's nothing much you can do about it. The horse, the horse, the horse needs to be utilized. Also, in certain conditions where the owner doesn't have enough uh, money financially to uh, to treat the horse, you know, you should recommend euthanasia. Why would you make a horse suffer? You know? So definitely, uh, once uh, you feel that the owner is not financially able, recommend euthanasia. It's up to him to decide, him or her to decide if uh, the horse needs to be put down. Yeah. Uh, now, once you have uh, dealt your colic uh, medically or surgically, the next decision is how you are going to feed them, right? Uh, someone has asked me, any clinic gives you DEXA, why would you want to use DEXA? I wouldn't use DEXA. DEXA, it can, it can suppress uh, many things, but I wouldn't use DEXA uh, in a colic. Yeah? What support to be done? Are there any chance of them that can cause more severe prolonged displacement? Oh, yes. Oh yes, you don't want to do lunge of horse if it's having impaction uh, or a very bad uh, displacement. I mean, you're getting things worse, you could end up in a rupture. So be very careful. Uh, Lunging is not always needed. Uh, only in case of uh, such as a nephrosplenic or you think there's a, like a gas distension or spasm, you can go for a, a lunging, but be very careful. Yeah, Don't push your leg. Please suggest practical tips for gas to decompression, especially in age, age groups two to four. Uh, well, uh, everything depends on how you restrain the horse. Uh, I mean, uh, it's how you use the foal or the horse. It all depends on how you restrain. Once you have them under control, gastric decompression is pretty capable. And, and always uh, put a sufficient amount of lubricant over your tube because if you push your tube and there's not enough of lubrication, you can end up in bleeding, you know, it's taxes. So I'll definitely uh, lube your tube before you insert into the uh, yeah, nasal passage. Right, so um, also, you know, how to feed your horse post episode of colic or abdominal surgery? Not much of research has been done. Uh, the primary thing when you see a horse is colicking, the one thing you always need to tell the owner take all sorts of food because eating more will create get the situation even more worse. So, when you see a horse has been colicking, first thing will take away the food and uh, exercise the horse, like walk the horse. But yeah, food should be withdrawn. Uh, water we withdraw depending on what we think the condition is. For example, if you're having proximal arthritis, no water because the more they drink, the more the stomach gets distended. So there's no point in giving water. Rather do uh, IV fluids. So yeah, no feeling at all. Then once you have treated the colic medically, yeah, what we generally do once you see there's normal fecal output, once you see that the clinical signs are within normal limits, you can slowly start feeding them hay. What we generally do is we give one hand of hay. And so how do you handle it? The reasonable hand of him you give to the horse, see how he does, how he or she does after, after they consume the hay. If they are good, well, start giving them every four hours. And if they are getting better, uh, decrease the uh, time interval, like four hours you're being given. So then increase, increase the quantity from one hand, go to two hands of hay. Yeah, and increase the quantity. And by day three, you can give a small hay net. And if they're still comfortable eating that and they are passing normal manual, good. That means your horse is outside, out of the colic, yeah? And also, preferably what you could also do, the initial feeding time, you could give uh, a laxative diet that's more of grass, because it's easily digestible. Uh, what we do is also give mash. Now, mash is uh, it's, it's a manufactured food, uh, which we get to buy, and we add that with a bit of uh, water or paraffin oil, because it helps in, uh, in the easy passage of feces. So that's what we do. So we combine hay, like giving every four hours, intermittently with the uh, mash, mash with oil. And then once you have uh, started and the horse is doing well, you can start giving grain diet. 
three to four days later, start with small amounts of grains, divide by three to four meals. Because mind you, the horse's uh, gastrointestinal tract has undergone a bit of a you know, trauma. So we don't want to rush with feeding the horse everything. So just that everything is like an engine that's been stuck. So you need to make it start functioning normally. So you start with small amount of grains. And then as the horse you know, feeds it and feels okay about it, increase your, your, your amount of uh, grains or pellet diet. And uh, after a surgical colic, it is based on what you see and uh, what the procedure was being conducted. Right. So this next question can we give uh, milk post colic before any other? Uh, milk, I'm referring, I think you're referring to folds. Yes, you could, provided you know that uh, the fold is doing well. So you can slowly start with milk. Right, so I think this can be coming to the end of our presentation. Prevention, basically, as the famous adage goes, prevention is better than cure. So, what you could recommend to the woman is that uh, the feeding, you know, uh, the core ratio between the dry matter and the concentrate ratio, which we discussed initially, uh, do not feed too much of a pellet diet, rather, feed more of a roughage. Uh, then, avoid any factors that cause like for example stress, you know, find out about stress, but then if you find your horse is stressed, you avoid these factors that cause stress, yeah, uh, then uh, avoid sudden change of the diet, like uh, I, I mentioned to you how you do 25 percent in which you change the concentrate and the uh, forage over a certain period of time, then uh, uh, basically keep your hay and feed boxes clean, free of mold and dust, because molds can cause uh, Colic, uh, then to follow regular deworming for effective parasitic control depending on how or what's your load. Uh, do regular dentists, very, very important, which is actually people don't uh, emphasize a lot, but dentistry do it as help in uh, uh, preventing colics. And uh, in places where there's a lot of sand, keep the foot off the ground to avoid uh, sand ingestion so that uh, your horse doesn't eat. Uh, Sand along with the hay. Uh, there's a question that please suggest managing a pot belly young equines, which has been observed to have a pot or deworming. Pot belly definitely deworming. So you need to see that uh, it's free of uh, worms. Uh, can we allow the horse to roll more if it's showing a sign of pot? <laughs> no, I wouldn't recommend that. Don't, 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 don't. Uh, I mean, uh, I wouldn't recommend more of rolling. Walk as much as possible. Yeah. Because if you do more rolling, it can sometimes prefer torsion or displacement may get worse. So my email ID, sure. There we go. Uh, I will just ready. Right. Uh, but if you don't want any problem with horses, and if you want to prevent all sorts of danger, as you see in the spot picture it's got is that bubble wrap your horse. I mean you can avoid the, the wet mills so you can have a bus safe and sound. Yeah. Right. I think that's my last slide. Thank you all. I mean, thanks for the questions. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Yeah. So any questions? <laughs> uh, I hope not. <laughs> Getting along. Thank you. So, yeah, you're welcome. I mean, uh, I'm happy, I'm more than you know, I'm honored and privileged to do this presentation. So, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, especially to the zone, uh, Santosh, for giving me the chance, uh, IBA, especially IBA Kerala, uh, Mohammed, my, my Patrick, Mohammed Aslam. Thank you very much. Thanks to all. Yeah, God bless you all. Stay safe, stay healthy. I think uh, yeah, that's the end. Hope there are no more questions. You're welcome. So I think I'll 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 I'll, I'll sign out. Yeah.